Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ed Flynn. I'm the City Council President. Viewers can watch today's meeting live on YouTube by visiting boston.gov slash citycouncil-tv. I'd like to ask my colleagues and those in the audience to please silence your cell phones and electronic devices. Thank you. I'd also like to ask everyone here to be respectful and do not disrupt the meeting while you are here. If you are disruptive, you will be asked to leave. And if you fail to comply, you will be escorted out. Please note, according to City Council rules, there are no signs allowed in the chamber. Mr. Clerk, will you please call the roll to ascertain the presence of a quorum, please? Councilor Lawyer. Present. Councilor Baker. Here. Councilor Bork. Councilor Braden. Here. Councilor Coletta. Councilor Fernandez Anderson. Councilor Flaherty. Here. Councilor Flynn. Here. Council Lara. Council Luigian. Here. Council Mejia. Here. Council Murphy. Here. And Council Worrell. I have been informed by the clerk that a quorum is present. Mr. Clerk, can you please add Council, Council Bach? Yep. Mr. Clerk, can you please add Council Baker and Council Carter? This week's clergy is invited by City Councilor Frank Baker. City Councilor Frank Baker, would you like to come to the podium, introduce our clergy for today? Thank you, Mr. President. Today I have the, the distinct honor of, of bringing to you Reverend David Searles. Uh, Reverend Searles has, has been a pastor at Central Assembly of God Church since 1993. He serves on East Boston's trauma team the East Boston Hub, and as chaplain with the PACE program at the East Boston Health Center. R Reverend Searles is a member of the Ella Baker House Anti-Violence Task Force and is one of the founders of Boston SOS, Safety in Our Schools, which is a community group advocating for safe schools here in Boston, and he lives in East Boston with his wife, Barbara. With that, I bring you the Reverend. Thank you, Councillor Baker, uh, for the opportunity to be here and to say the prayer over these proceedings. It's an honor to be here with our city council and all the members here, and we appreciate your work in the city. I come with you, to you with a heavy heart as a pastor in the city of Boston now for 32 years. I started ministry in Boston in 1990 in Dorchester in Fields Corner when the city was facing its greatest challenge with street violence. I witnessed the trauma upon young people. I was in East Boston in 2015 when we had five youth homicides. I conducted the public vigils for the victims' families and the community. On December 10, 2017, a young 19-year-old church member in our church, Duncan Ketter, Recognized as a hero in the community by saving somebody who had fallen on the MBTA tracks, he jumped in to save them, was murdered in East Boston. I walked with that immigrant family through the extraordinary trauma that they experienced that day and the weeks ahead and in the years ahead. I conducted the funeral service for him in East Boston and then traveled with the family to Kenya where I conducted a funeral for the the folks gathered there, a thousand people gathered to honor that young man in his memory. The grief runs deep. That story is hard. And now I stand before you at a time when we are facing a school safety crisis in the city of Boston. This must be a top priority of our leadership. Every week we see the evidence of youth violence happening in our streets and in our schools. We must not ignore it. Let the words of a parent, a Boston parent, Naomi Hastings, 
ring in our ears and in our heart. People, it's time to wake up. And with that, let us pray. Lord, we are in a school safety crisis in the great city of Boston, and I need to ask, how long, O Lord? How long must students attend schools where weapons are present? How long must our students attend school in fear? How long must a grandmother weep for her grandson who was violently assaulted in the bus to school? How long must a father grieve for his son who was assaulted, choked, and beaten until he lost consciousness in the school cafeteria? How long must a mother weep for the lost opportunity for a daughter who had to ask for a safety transfer to another school because of bullying? How long must our students, parents, teachers, bus drivers, bus monitors endure in the midst of a school safety crisis in Boston? I pray, O oh Lord, that you will help our leaders across the city to acknowledge the urgency of the hour in our schools. I pray for a safety plan that will meet the needs of our students, our parents, our teachers, our staff in Boston schools. Lord, may you give this great city council the wisdom and courage to address our school safety crisis. Lord, bless the work of this city council and give us your peace. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Could everyone please join us in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Mr. Clerk, can we reflect the record that Councilor Fernandez Anderson is present, Councilor Lara is present, Council Rell is present? At this time, I would like to ask my City Council colleague, Councilor Coletta, to please come to the podium for a special presentation um, before before Council Coletta speaks, I do want to acknowledge the, some of the men and women from the Plumbers and Gas Fitters Local Union 12 that are here with us today. Uh, thank you for the tremendous work you do across Greater Boston, across Massachusetts. Thank you. Council Coletta. Thank you, Council President Flynn. Um, today is uh, a very, very special day uh, here in the city of Boston. I am um, I'm honored to have up here on the podium Rocco Adessa, who after 42 years of service to the city of Boston and its people will be retiring today. He deserves that and, and way more. You've definitely seen him in City Hall. You know him, you love him. He comes to his job every single day with a positive attitude. And just a little bit um, about him uh, before we present him this resolution, and I pass it over to my colleague, Councillor Frank Baker, who has a special relationship with him. Um, he is a son of East Boston. He grew up on Saratoga Street in Eagle Hill. He's a graduate of East Boston High School. And you know, directly from high school, he came over to the city. He didn't want to do anything else, is what he said. He wanted to serve the city and its people. He started in, in Boston in 1984, um, which means that he served under six mayors, dating all the way back to Kevin White, uh, Mayor Flynn, Mayor Menino, Mayor Walsh, Mayor Janey, and now Mayor Wu. Um, Rocco has said that the best part of his job is receiving positive feedback from his superiors and that that is what drives him throughout the entirety of his day. And he loves saying hi to the mayor, he loves saying hi to all the elected officials, and he loves saying hi, more importantly, or most importantly, to the people of Boston. Um, personally, Rocco is a family friend of mine. I always love seeing out in, in East Boston. Uh, side note, 
He is a political bellwether. If he's with you, you're in good hands. You know that that bodes well for you in your political career. Um, he's always been a close friend to me and a supporter of mine. Um, and I am just truly humbled to honor him in this way. So thank you for everything, Rocco. You're the best. <laughs> Councilor Baker. Thank you, Rocco, for your service. Um, so in 1986, I started walking up Tremont Street from Don Bosco Tech. I was a custodian, and one of the first people I met was, was Rocco. Showed me everything, showed me everything he knows. Um, but we had, we had good times. He actually said to Councilor Coletta that I was crazy, so I guess he did, he did have a pretty good read on me right from the beginning. But, um, you know, we, we, we want to honor our people that do the work, that allow us to keep the lights open, to allow us to keep the doors, the, the doors open and lights on. Um, and as a city worker, I'm, I'm, I'm proud to call you my friend, and I thank you for your, for your time. We had a good crew back then. We were reminiscing about basically a lot of people that aren't with us now that, that, that helped this building become what it was and the departments become what they are, the evolution of those departments. I tell you, it's different in 37 years. 37 years ago, nearly, I'm gonna leave that detail out. Anyways, Rocco, thank you and you're, you're great for the city. Do you wanna say something? Say hi to everyone and thank them. All right. Th thanks, guys. Thanks. Um, I used to work with him and my counselor. Well, she was running for us, and I was the one who got her elected from <laughs> East Boston. Everybody says that. Thank you. Thank you, Rocco. Thank you. We're going to present you with this resolution now on behalf of the City Council. So be it resolved that the Boston City Council extended its congratulations to Rocco Odessa in recognition of his long service and dedication to the city of Boston and its people. Thank you, Rocco. Thank you. you guys want to join us for a photo? You're right in the middle, Leo. I'm right here in the middle. Congratulations. He's not retiring. He's been a lot of work for the Chelsea. That's what he told me. I think he's lying. I don't think you're going to do Rocco was also close with City Council Michael Flaherty and City Council Lydia Edwards as well. At this time, I would like to ask two of my colleagues, Council Mejia and Councilor Fernandez Anderson, to please come to the podium, podium for a special recognition as well. Um, Councilors. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, buenas tardes. Todo el mundo tiene que tengo que hablar en español porque la recipiente de que vi voy a reconocer a hoy es um, una mujer latina. Um, a hoy quiero representar a señora Iris Calderón. Si puedes, um, Iris. Venga para acá. Venga para acá, por favor. Pictures are important. Mm 
Señora. Señora Iris es una, una persona que trabaja aquí por la ciudad de Boston por 30 años ahora. Y ella sin reclamar, sin complejo, siempre trabaja duro, siempre con sonrisa en la cara, siempre bien simpática con todos, bien amable y trabaja profesionalmente aquí para nosotros, nos ayuda a todos nosotros aquí en la ciudad y queremos reconocerla por, por su trabajo profesionalmente y también con su corazón y amistad. Bueno, Muchísimas gracias. Quiero que digas unas palabras aquí y puede traducir. Eh, buenas tardes. Para mí es una gran alegría el estar aquí presente con los cónsulers de Boston. Muchas gracias por el tiempo que me han otorgado como trabajadora aquí. Estoy muy agradecida. Si no fuera por ustedes, yo no hubiera sostenido un hogar por 33 años, no tuviera una casa. Y estoy tan agradecida por todos mis, mis hermanos inmigrantes. Soy de Guatemala. Uh, Good afternoon. I'm very happy to be here and work here in the city of Boston. I'm very grateful for you because if I, if it wasn't because of my employment, I wouldn't be able to take care of myself and my family. And um, you guys can fill in the rest. Soy sobreviviente de cáncer. Tengo cinco años. I de may... estar, tengo diabetes y sigo trabajando fuerte para demostrar de que no somos una carga para este país. Venimos a luchar por nuestros sueños, por nuestros hijos para que ellos sean unas mejores personas. Muchísimas gracias. Uh, Ms. Iris is from Guatemala, and she has actually been in remission. She's a, a cancer survivor now for 25 years. Cinco años. Five years. Um, and, ¿qué más? Tengo diabetes y sigo trabajando, luchando por el bienestar de mis hijos. Although she struggles with diabetes, she continues to work and fight for her family. Y muchísimas gracias a todos los cónsules y a todas las personas que nos ayudan aquí. De verdad, de verdad que estoy muy agradecida por el trato que nos dan a nosotros como inmigrantes en este país, especialmente en Boston. Muchas gracias. 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 Um, I'm not going to translate everything because uh, Councillor Anderson did a great job, but I just wanted to uplift a, uh, one, a few things about um, Every, every, when before COVID hit, um, I had an opportunity to sit with Edie's and, and listen to her story and listen to how difficult it has been for her to be here in the city of Boston working and how many times that she has been disregarded and disrespected, but she still shows up for work every day. And to sit there and listen to her and her struggle, um, it, reminds of, it reminds me of the work that I was brought here to do because like, I see you and we love you and we appreciate you. And I know every single counselor here, all 13 of us, when we walk by you, we recognize how much you give to this community that we have here on the fifth floor here in City Hall. So muchas gracias por siempre estar aquí con nosotros, Iris. Sorry, uh, the final sentence, Ms. Iris, I wanted to say thank you to all the counselors, thank you for everyone in the city for your kindness and for always uh, treating her with respect. Um, if you guys can please join us for a picture to congratulate Ms. Iris, thank you very much. Thank you for your patience. Um, 
This one is also a really special one for uh, myself and I know for um, Council Mahir and the rest of my council colleagues. I wanted to thank you for your patience while we um, acknowledge this next person. Um, Keon Sprinkle is not only a friend, but a very good friend of my husband, Tanzarius Anderson. And um, as we know here in the carceral system uh, is in much need of much reform. And many of our black and brown uh, men disproportionately get wrongfully convicted of crimes that they did not commit. Keon Sprinkle is someone who's been exonerated and after um, serving decades of uh, time in prison has now uh, been released. And in this moment, we can give certificates and recognize people for the good and their perseverance and their resilience um, post uh, so, so much harm. Um, and yet, it does not make up for everything that has been done to this young man. So um, as a friend and as a friend of my uh, family, I'd like to ask you to please uh, congratulate Mr. Sprinkle in all of his community uh, contributions in the fight for our community towards uh, criminal justice reform. Thank you. I'm his mom's favorite, just so you all know. <laughs> um, okay, well, kind of caught off guard. I want to thank all of y'all for having me here. Um, the work that you do is important. Um, I've been, this woman, I've been hearing about her since I was a child. And this one I'm so proud of, and all of y'all actually, and the work never has to end. We always have to keep going forward. I know there's a lot of things happening with the youth right now. Um, a lot of it got to do with sometimes just needing a little bit more attention most of the time. Um, they're not irredeemable. Um, they just need somebody to kind of like listen to them and not talk at them, but kind of talk to them. And that'll work. I know firsthand and all of us was young, so I'll just leave it at that because I don't want to be long-winded. Thank you all for having me. Thank you. We're going we're gonna to invite, because I know we have a few more to give, and I don't want to um, take up any more time, but I'm going to ask my colleagues to come up so we can take a photo. Come on up. You'd be in the center. <laughs> He Luz, can you raise your hand, Luz? Can you make sure you connect? Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, and I know we have a long agenda and want to be super mindful that uh, we are here to, um, to celebrate and, and to highlight um, the work of so many, what we're calling unsung heroes. These are people here in our city of Boston who give so much of themselves every day and oftentimes are, are never seen or heard. And I wanted to just thank President Flynn for giving me the opportunity to, um, to be, uh, to welcome folks. And just so you know, I know I am being mindful of time, we had a pre-reception where our, our, our nominees were able to speak. So we're not gonna have a speaking engagement with the five people that I'm honoring here today just to keep things moving, but I want you all to know that they had an opportunity to be fully expressed, just in case you're wondering. Um, 
So I want to bring up my first uh, nominee. Uh, he, this is someone who I have been in deep community with, working in the trenches in the Boston Public Schools with a 32 years of experience working in the Boston Public Schools as a parent a BPS graduate, a grandparent, an administrator, the one and only Edith Bazil, who is always holding BPS accountable to racial equity in our Boston public schools. We are so much better because of you and how hard you work for all of our students, Edith. Thank you. Thank you so much, Honorable Councilor Mejia, and thank you, Council President Flynn and all the counselors who work so hard in education. Thank you for all of your hard work. I appreciate this honor. See how quickly we're moving it along, y'all? Good job, because I'm greedy, I got five, so let me keep it moving. This is another one. I want to um, ask Devon McNeil to make his way here. This is a young man who I met out in these streets, as I always do. He had a vision after spending 20 years incarcerated, came out, and he said, not under my watch, created a program dedicated specifically to helping support black and brown boys do better. And not only has he done that, he is expanding his programming, and I am so incredibly happy to honor him and his work here today. Hello, peace, and thank you for having me this morning. Thank you. All right, so I wanted to acknowledge, you know, when we talk about parent advocacy and we talk about the role that parents play in helping to inform the conversation, this is a parent, Sylvia Cross, who is a resident of Roxbury and the parent of a student at the David E. A. Ellis School and the co-chair of the Parent Council and a member of the RDM Higher Ground Parent Coalition, which I was a founding member of, so it's so good to see you rising up above. Um. I just want to say thank God uh, first for allowing me to be here. I also want to thank all the counselors, Higher Ground, RDM, David A. Ellis School, everyone. I'm, I'm in so much. Um, I'm just very, very honored and grateful to be here. Thank you. All right. We are moving on to the next. Uh, Patricia Odom, who I met at a fair, an artist in her own right, a powerhouse, someone who worked in the Boston Public Schools with uh, over 20 years, and also has a, um, one of the first black female recruiters for the Massachusetts National Guard, the first woman and the first black woman to serve in that role. So here is your recognition, and we uh, so much appreciate you. Thank you very much. I am so honored to, uh, to have this time and thank all the counselors, everyone that's involved. It's a great response. Thank you so much. And, and I bought one of her paintings. If you want to check it out, you can come by my office. Okay, I'm going to have you do the next one. Come on. <laughs> all right, uh, this one is a very special one. As, uh, and I've acknowledged um, him here before, but um, twice, three times, it's never enough. Um, so Garrison Trot is the longest conti uh, continuing community-based neighborhood association in Boston, established in 1978. And they have not stopped co uh, coordinating, researching, fighting, and negotiating on behalf of the residents and members of their organization, from block watch to street sign to education to housing development to health equity to public safety. GTNA has collaborated, co coordinated, aligned, and intertwined its programs and activities with progressive groups, agencies, voter education, and civic engagement bodies and organizations committed to progressive politics, social growth, equity, and opportunity. They continue their vision today, 45 years later, thanks to their dedicated board and most importantly, the residents who have continuously worked alongside and supported in the common unity called community. I'd like to uh, take the time to recognize Mr. Louis Elisa for your long, hard work <laughs> and the fight to bring equity to Roxbury. Yes. Come on down, Lewis. And if you guys know, you probably get thousands of emails from Lewis always yelling at us about something. This is the guy behind those emails, just so you know. <laughs> Thank you. On behalf of uh, Lucille, I'm Vice, I'm Vice President Garrison Trotter, our 45 years has been a labor of love. We could not be here without the work of Dan Richardson, Dan and Marlena Richardson, Alma Lewis, Matthew Good, Ellen Jackson, 
uh, Alma Wright, Herb Jackson, uh, Carl Nurse, and, um, and Connie, and a number of other people who do not see, who do not see it robbery to take time to give to their community. And so we're fulfilling a commitment that we heard and made a long time ago. Um, Congresswoman once said, service is the rent you pay for room on the surface. So we're trying to fulfill our rent paid in full. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to ask my colleagues to come up so we can take a group picture with all of our recipients. And just wanted to, again, thank President Flynn for giving us the opportunity to be here with you all celebrating in community these amazing unsung heroes. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, we Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Fernandez Anderson, Councilor Mejia, for that wonderful presentation. Thank you for the important work these community leaders are doing in the neighborhoods of Boston. We also recognized Rocco. We, this, mo this morning, myself and Councilor Fernandez Anderson and our colleagues held a reception for the municipal police officers. But what, but what we saw today is whether people work for the city or, or work in the community, you people make Boston a better city. And it's about working together. It's about treating people with respect. And that's what we've seen during these presentations. But thank you to the wonderful work these community leaders are doing in their neighborhoods across, across the city. Approval of the minutes. The first order of business is the approval of the minutes. Seeing and hearing no discussion on the matter, the chair moves to approve the minutes from the last meeting. All those in favor of approving the minutes from the last meeting say aye. aye. All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. The minutes of the last meeting stand as approved. Communications from Her Honor the Mayor. Mr. Clerk, can you please read docket 0407? <coughs> Document number 0407, message in order for your approval. In order at the recommendation of the Chair of the Board of Election Commissioners, I hereby transmit for the approval of your honorable body an order fixing the date of the preliminary election for this municipal year as September 12, 2023. Thank you. This docket 0407 will be referred to the Committee on City Services. Innovation Technology. Mr. Clerk, can you please read docket 0408, please? Docket number 0408. Message in order for your approval, a home rule petition to the general court regarding a special law authorizing the city of Boston to implement rent stabilization and tenant eviction protections. Thank you. This docket 0408 will be referred to the Committee on Government Operations. Reports of public officers and others. Mr. Clerk, please read docket 0409, please. Docket number 0409. Notice was received from the mayor of the appointment of Jerrica Bradley as temporary second assistant collector treasurer for the period of 60 days, effective January 25th, 2023. This docket will be placed on file. Reports of committees. Mr. Clerk, please read docket 0135. Docket number 0135, the Committee on Government Operations to which was referred on January 11th. Docket number 0135, petition for a special law regarding an act relative to the reorganization of the Boston School Committee. Submits a report recommending that the whole move petition ought to pass in a new draft. Thank you. The Chair recognizes Council Arroyo, the Chair of the Committee on Government Operations. Council Arroyo, you have the floor. Thank you, Council President Flynn. Uh, I want to begin uh, by just noting that this matter was originally filed 
on August 18, 2021. Uh, since then, the Committee on Government Operations has held two hearings, uh, one on December 4th of 2021, uh, another on April 11th of 2022, uh, as well as three working sessions, one on April 14th of 2022, one on January 24th of this year, and finally on February 6th of this year. Uh, I'd also like to thank my original co-sponsor, uh, Julia Mejia, on this matter, and my council colleagues for attending those hearings and working sessions. Uh, those edits and those changes and amendments that I have received from the members of this body have strengthened this document. I also want to take a moment to thank uh, our central staff, specifically uh, Christine O'Donnell, for her help uh, in making sure that this is legally sound and that everything that we do uh, was given the appropriate legal review. So thank you very much for that. Um, this, originally, this document, as filed, created three phases uh, for the elected school committee. In, in other words, we would phase into a fully elected school committee in three separate elections, three separate phases. Uh, since then, based on the analysis and the reviews uh, and the feedback that we have, we've reviewed those language suggestions. Uh, we've discussed those suggestions. Those suggestions include a more streamlined phasing of an elected school committee, the body structure, uh, term limits, and more defined language around vacancies. The amended legislation now establishes two non-voting members to be selected by the Boston Public Schools through a vote by the Boston Student Advisory Council uh, and includes two phases. Phase one, after the first municipal election following the passage of this act, a 13-member school committee will be composed of nine district school committee members and four appointees by the mayor. Uh, in 2027, or whenever the next preceding municipal election would be, uh, four at-large school committee members would be elected, replacing those appointments uh, and turning the body into a fully elected body. Uh, lastly, there's two new sections, uh, section 9A and 9B, which speak on what and how uh, the school committee would handle vacancies, uh, specifically uh, the special election process. The one major difference here is uh, we use much of the framework of what we do here on the city council. Uh, regarding district seats having special elections. However, with the at-large vacancy, whereas on the city council, regardless of whether you got one vote or 10 votes, if you're the fifth person in line, you get moved up when the city councilor at-large moves on. In this model, we modeled it off of other municipalities in the city of Boston where you need at least 20% of total ballots votes cast to actually be considered to uh, move into that seat. Uh, and now I just wanna give some commentary on where we are on the school committee uh, and my personal thoughts on this. Uh, the city as a whole spoke overwhelmingly and resoundingly in support of an elected school committee when this was on a non-binding referendum. It received 79% of the vote, uh, won every precinct in the city of Boston. I cannot recall any issue that has performed that well on the ballot. Uh, specifically, uh, I see this as in line with the will of our constituents, the will of our voters, uh, to have control of our school committee returned to them. Uh, currently under the mayoral control system, we've been under that system for 30 years. I grew up attending school committee meetings. My father was part of the original <coughs> appointed board to the school committee. He later would go on to be a president of that school committee. He also ran for this seat when it was an elected seat. And so I'm very familiar with the working of a school committee in its appointed form, and it's very clear that that model, of which we are the only municipality in the state to have, has not served us well, uh, has not given independent voice to our school committee members, has not led to, uh, the belief was that this would lead to more parental involvement or stakeholder control in that system, and it has not led to that. And frankly, uh, and this is not an indictment on our mayor, uh, who uh, has been vocal about her opposition to this, but I simply think that the idea that in a city where we have a strong mayoral system, where the mayor is responsible for almost every facet and every function in this city, the idea that they can essentially replace a school committee or not have a school committee as a check from the people uh, and do that in a, in a working format has been proven to not work uh, simply by the model that we've seen over time. Uh, and so uh, I'm grateful uh, both to the advocates who have pushed for an elected school committee, to my colleagues who have stood uh, and worked to make this a better document, a better uh, working component. The way that this would currently work, just so that it's perfectly clear, is that upon passage, this home rule petition would require the signature of the mayor, 
It would then have to go through the legislature. It would have to be signed by the governor. Upon signing by the governor, it would then go to the very next municipal election, which, based on the timeline that we have now, uh, is most likely, if this moves in an orderly fashion, to be the 2005 municipal election. That would be the election where nine district councilor, district school committee members would be appointed, uh, selected, and, and and would run and would get appointed and elected in that year. And then you would have four appointments still held over, so there would still be four appointments. That next following municipal election would then be the one where four at-large school committee members join the committee uh, and you would then dissolve those appointed seats. So in, in other words, this would be an orderly transition. It would give time for a transition. This would not be a complete dissolution of the, city, uh, the school committee. Uh, you would still have appointed members in that transitionary period. So it would go from nine district members plus four appointed. They would then have two years under their belt as district school committee members and there would be an election for those, two, uh, for those four at-large seats to then join them, and then it would be fully elected, which would give, I think, all appropriate folks time uh, to transition in an orderly way to make sure that we're not destabilizing our system, to make sure that folks have time to know that these are now elected seats, and for people to mount a candidacy or to uh, tune into the fact that there are a candidacy, uh, our candidates now for an elected school committee. And so uh, the phasing in approach uh, is similar to what was done in Chicago. They did a phased in approach. They did not do a rip the Band-Aid off, everybody's off. Uh, approach, I think that's a responsible decision simply because it maintains some continuity in the, in the transitionary period. Uh, secondly, uh, we do have a, a separate home rule petition that will be going forward for elected members, uh, not elected, rather appointed voting members students, uh, and we'll get into that. But this, this one, this one does include students in the same form in which they are currently there. We currently have a member of the student body on the school committee who has no voting power. This would simply make it so that there are two non-voting student members who would be replaced by that second home rule petition, uh, which will be coming up right after this one. Uh, I just want to uh, finish with uh, the belief that passage of this act in its amended form is consistent with the will of Boston voters, who in 2021 overwhelmingly voted to restore an elected school committee. And as chair of government operations, I ask that this docket ought to pass in a new draft. Uh, and at, at this time, uh, I'd also like to ask the clerk uh, if we can substitute, uh, and the president, if we could substitute docket 0406 petition for a special law relative to an act establishing student voting on the Boston School Committee from page 9 of the green sheets, 6 down from the top of the page. Uh, the amended docket uh, will hopefully be properly before the body so that we can vote on both simultaneously. Thank you, Council Royal. Thank you. Uh, Mr. President, I'll reserve uh, my commentary on that for when we pull that. It'll be brief. That's fine. Thank you. Mr. Clark. If anyone would like to speak. We're staying, we're staying on the current document docket that we're, we're on. Would anyone like to speak on this matter? I know a lot of colleagues would like to speak. Um, usually we have, what, what is that? Okay. The chair recognizes Council Mejia. Thank you, Mr. President, for allowing me to speak. Um, and I just wanted to thank my colleague, Councilor Arroyo, for his leadership in this space. And I also want to acknowledge the Yes on Three um, advocates who worked so hard at getting us this, to this point. So I just want to say thank you 
for uh, all the door knocking, all the phone banking, and all of the organizing that we had to do to help parents understand what was at stake. Um, and hold, hosting community conversations in multiple languages in their native languages so people could understand what we were trying to do. Um, so I just want to say thank you all for your leadership and working alongside our office to amplify why this moment was so important. And so as a BPS graduate, as a BPS parent, and as a BPS advocate, I see this as one of the biggest voting rights issues here in the city of Boston because it's about an opportunity to restore um, the trust in what democracy looks like. It's an opportunity for us to give the people back the power in our Boston public schools. We go to countless school committee meetings and parents are advocating and students and all of that advocacy tends to fall on deaf ears because who are they accountable to? No one. So I believe that this moment, if we're really serious about repairing the harm, it's an opportunity for us to um, join the countless other municipalities across the state in having a voice in what this looks like. So I am incredibly encouraged and incredibly hopeful that uh, we are going to rise to the occasion and vote in favor of passing this and bringing it into the next level because this is the will of the people. And we know who we serve. So if the city of Boston sent us with a mandate to make this happen, it is our responsibility to deliver on that mandate. And I look forward to my colleagues joining me um, in voting in favor of passing this today. Thank you. Thank you, Council Mejia. Would anyone like to speak on this matter? If so, please, um, please raise your hand. Um, the chair recognizes Council Flaherty. Council Flaherty, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President, and I obviously appreciate the uh, chair's uh, work and attention to detail as well as the uh, co-sponsor in, in, in that effort uh, of um, proposing an amendment, uh, Mr. President, to docket uh, 0135. Com Council Flaherty has offered an amendment to the docket. Mr. Clerk. A copy of this docket, a copy of this um, draft is being sent around now. Can I second that? Ready for that yet? In, in, in a minute. In a minute we will. I'm happy to speak on it, uh, Mr. President, um, while folks are getting an opportunity to read it. Mr. Clerk, can you please read the amendment into the record? It's been seconded by uh, Councilor Baker. Amendment of Councilor Michael Flaherty, docket number 0135. Docket 0135, petition for a special law and act relative to the reorganization of the Boston School Committee as amended shall be further amended as follows. Striking section two, Section 3, Section 6, Section 7, Section 8, and Section 9B, replacing said Section 2 as follows. Section 2, subject to the provisions of this Act, the existing school committee of the City of Boston shall be dissolved, and the composition of the school committee of the City of Boston shall transition to seven members. School committee phased in as follows, starting in September 6, 2023. Two voting student members shall be selected by the Boston Public School student population through a vote of the Boston Student Advisory Council. The students will be seated with the school committee and allowed to participate in discussion and voting. B, the school committee shall remain as constituted aside from the addition of the two student members until the municipal election outlined in section two, subsection C, as outlined below, is held and certified. C, the first Tuesday after the first Monday following the second municipal election year, immediately following passage of this act, a five-member school committee comprised of five at-large members elected in November of the previous year shall be seated. 
The, the chair recognizes Council Flaherty. Council Flaherty, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Again, uh, respecting the work of our uh, colleague and chair, as well as the co-sponsor, and all of our colleagues who've had input. Uh, I've been uh, a long-time supporter and on record uh, of supporting a return to an elected school committee. Our school committee members should be held accountable uh, to our school system's end users, which are our school children and their parents and guardians. While a hybrid committee uh, may appeal to some uh, as a compromise, I believe the voters of Boston can and should be trusted to exercise good judgment in the best interest of children and grandchildren here in the city. According to my beliefs in those matters, it's about improving our Boston public school system and creating greater autonomy, which means greater accountability to parents and grandparents, which is why I'm proposing uh, this amendment for a smaller, more accountable, uh, results-driven elected body. The voters have spoken on this issue via a non-binding ballot initiative, which, quite frankly, I'd prefer to have been binding, uh, but uh, they uh, signaled uh, the city uh, for accountability uh, and for results. They, in my opinion, they did not vote for another bureaucratic entity. They did not vote for a return of the uh, old school committee. They didn't vote for something that was too big and too unwieldy. Uh, with all kinds of moving parts, which has sort of been sort of part and parcel to, to this debate. Um, they voted for immediate action. They voted for results. They've had it. We boast the best colleges and universities in the world, but when it comes to our Boston public school system, we're not so boastful. We've got bright spots. We've made some progress here, some progress there, uh, but it hasn't been a rising tide. And too many of our kids are being left behind. We're in a global economy. Just take a look at the South Boston waterfront with STEM, all the companies, the CEOs that are moving their companies here, looking to tap into our intellectual capital, uh, the fact that uh, we we're a, a, a livable and, and walkable and relatively safe city to cities our size or bigger. We've got a lot of great things going for us. Uh, unfortunately, that economic opportunity, those job opportunities aren't trickling out throughout the neighborhoods uh, to the children, particularly those that go to the Boston Public Schools. Not enough of our Boston Public School kids are getting into these great schools. And sadly, the ones that do are usually home after the first semester, uh, not able to, to, to cut the academic rigor. So uh, the focus is now on us. And if we want to have a truly autonomous and accountable school committee, uh, I think we need to be at the seven member level. Five elected at large, two student voting members for a total of seven members. Let's, as you've heard me, I sound like a broken record lately. Let's keep it simple, let's keep it moving forward, and let it be about results so that we can finally put together and put forward a Boston public school system for our children that mirrors the colleges and universities that we host here in this city, where tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of students come here from all around the country in the world to get a great education. Our Boston public school system should be mirrored after that. We should be partnering. We should have pathways to all of those great schools that all call Boston their home. We can do that. Clearly, we as Boston City Council have a role in that. But I also think that if we're going to return to an elected school committee, we want to make sure we don't repeat the, the, uh, the problems of the past. And one way to do that is to keep it simple, uh, keep it from being unwieldy. I believe a 13-member body is unwieldy. I do not believe that the voters voted for that. The voters wanted accountability. The voters wanted autonomy. The voters, voters wanted results. But I completely disagree that they wanted a 13-member unwieldy body. I think they wanted us to keep it simple, get an elected school committee up and running, hold them accountable, working with our mayor and our new school superintendent, who I know are committed to what I've just talked about, making our schools the best schools that they can be. We can do it. If we keep it simple and we keep it focused on accountability and results, we get unwieldy and it becomes uh, about sort of politics and personalities uh, and we, we turn the clock back to uh, the school committee that was not productive, then a few years from now we'll have another ballot question returning it back to appointed. Don't want to be in that position. I think we have an opportunity here to put something forward that makes sense that answers what the voters wanted, but that we can truly hold accountable 
working with this body, working with the administration and our school superintendent. So again, I know you've had an opportunity of just getting, uh, because of our, in for full disclosure, Mr. President, because of open meeting law rules, I don't have the ability to circulate this in advance. I can't chit chat with folks in the hallway uh, and sort of start to, to, to whip, if you will, and to get folks on board. So unfortunately, the amendment is coming at this point because of the council rules and because of Robert's rules of order. So hopefully no one is offended with just learning about this for the first time. It's real simple. It's saying Mike Flaherty supports an elected school committee, but not to the tune of 13 members where you can't get a lot of business done and where the people of Boston, particularly the consumers, the students, their parents, grandparents and guardians have waited too long for accountability from our school committee. We on this body have the ability to do that. We have the ability to put forth something that will be uh, accountability and results driven. Keep it tight, keep it simple, move it forward. Thank you, Mr. President. Look forward to debate on it or uh, call for a vote at the appropriate time. And, and through the clerk, we obviously have, we have an active and open amendment on the floor to my colleagues that the, any vote that gets taken, the amendment gets taken first uh, for passage or for, for, uh, or for a reversion back to 0135. And again, I say that with all due respect to all of my colleagues and their opinions on this issue, the, the work that the chair has done, the work that the co-sponsors have done, the work that the advocates have done, I see a little bit differently. I see that the voters want something very specific. They were clear. They want accountability. They want results. They wanted them yesterday. And I just don't think going to a bureaucratic entity with 13 members is going to get us there. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you to my colleagues. Thank you, Council Flaherty. I just wanted to echo or, or follow up on one comment Council Flaherty mentioned about open meeting law. That is an important part of this body in making sure we're in full compliance. I, I do want to remind colleagues uh, we're still not able to, we're not able to um, text with each other. Um, if there is an emergency that you have to deal with, especially if in a family emergency, I would recommend that you take that call or text um, outside of this office. <clears throat> would anyone like to speak on Council Flaherty's amendment at this time? The chair recognizes the chair recognizes Council Arroyo. Thank you, <coughs> Council President Flynn, uh, and to uh, Councilor Flaherty. No offense taken on the on the notice. Uh, just trying to abide by rules makes sense. Uh, I would also just say that we are probably like ninety five percent in agreement on what what you're putting out here. The issue that I found, we did a number of community listening sessions uh, in the last year. Uh, I, I believe almost all of them virtual, uh, multiple languages. We had one in Mandarin, one in Spanish, one in English, one in Haitian Creole. We had counselors join us for these. One of the things that came up often, and, and if folks want to pull my record and Google my stances on this, I, when I first ran, uh, was consistently for either a hybrid or an elected based on what I believe voters and constituents wanted uh, I was open to both forms of governance. What I wasn't open to was a continuation of a fully appointed school committee. And over the course of this work, over the last 18 months that this has been filed, I've had many conversations with constituents, with advocates, uh, with folks who were both opposed to any version of an elected school committee and in support of a fully elected school committee. And what came up over and over and over again was the idea of uh, having a direct representative for their district, for their communities, uh, and that the at-large seats, uh, though they serve a role, they felt a personal connection to the idea of a district school committee member being part of that mix, that it was an essential part of that mix. I, too, was thinking about what is the right mix or number. Currently, our school committee is not 13 members. It was, at one time, 13 members. I think at other times, it's actually been even higher. Um, similar to this body. This body, I think at one point, had over 100 members. Uh, and so the reality is that there's a number of different ways to look at this. I personally just want to go on record. I think 13-person bodies do a pretty good job. Just going to put that out there. But I do think that the school committee uh, structure was made to make sure that there was a district voice. And one of the things that uh, we struggled with was if we did that based on the current district lines, that would require nine district voices. And I thought that it would be also important for us to, because we didn't want to leave out some districts that wouldn't make any sense or we would have to make brand new maps, uh, which also wouldn't make a lot of sense. And so we kept the nine and then we went with the at-large portion of that. Um, I, I think almost 
everything else that you are speaking on about the, the fact that voters want this, people want this, that we trust voters to make decisions for their own benefit and for what they believe to be right. And I, I don't always agree with voters, and I, sometimes I do, and I just think that the reality is that is what makes this country great. That's what makes this democracy great, is that we have that kind of representation. And I think that regardless of, uh, you know, if the body, the school committee itself is not functional, uh, though I think it will be and I think it can be, uh, I think voters will sort that out. And so uh, I fully support maintaining what we have. For that reason, I'll be voting against your amendment, but I take your amendment in good spirits. I understand what that amendment is about, is the size of the body and making sure that it does the people's work and that it's an effective body. And I think we share that hope. I think we disagree on whether districts or not are an essential part to that body. Uh, but from what I've heard from other folks in community, uh, there was a strong push for, for a community sort of district school committee member. I know my other district counselors will sort of express uh, the feelings that they get from representatives who have at large representation but very much enjoy and, and require sort of us as district counselors to be there. Um, and so I think this is an effective measure to make sure that all of the city has a voice guaranteed and then we have a, an at large system where people get to vote all over the city for that. So uh, I'm grateful to you for, for your participation. Uh, you have attended working sessions. You have been an advocate uh, for an elected school committee from before, for, from the start. Uh, and so I appreciate uh, your efforts on this. And I just want to be clear that I don't, that no offense taken on this. I just simply have a difference in opinion on what this structure should look like and how it should look like. And for that reason, I'll be voting no. But I think in agreement on the reasons, we're all, we're, we, we share a lot of similarity. Thank you, Councilor Flaherty. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Thank you, Council Royo. The chair recognizes Council Baker. Council Baker, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, Eleven years ago, when Benino was still in, I filed for a hybrid school committee. He was at the tail end of, I think, uh, it was about 870 votes straight where he had gotten um, unanimous votes, over 800 votes. Um, so that was my... Um, the reason why I wanted something different, and, and I saw it in the hybrid model that was still would give across the hall, who's ever in there, there's been three people since Menino, whoever's across the hall, I think the buck should stop with them. I'm at a, I'm at a um, four person appointed, three person at large hybrid, that's what I would vote for. Uh, my good colleague from South Boston talked about the bureaucracy. Let's talk about the um, inconsistencies that are happening in, in the, the school department now with all different mayors changing. We've all just been through the different changes in, in transitions. It's difficult. It's difficult on the city. It's difficult on a system. They've had multiple different superintendents. Now we want to put them through five years of elections, and those elections are going to be running concurrent with our elections. If you don't think that that's going to cause turmoil in the city and the streets, then you're not, you're not watching the game. So I think we need consistency more than anything. I will be voting yes on the amendments, although I'm not totally there with, with, with him either. I find that more simplified. If we are moving in, in a direction, it should be as simple as possible for the kids in the schools. You know, we talk about everybody wants a sound, wants a sound off and they want, a, they want a seat at the table. Everybody shouldn't have a seat at the table. That's why we paid people. That's why we have committees, commissions, people in charge to make those decisions. My problem 12 years ago was the amount of calls that I got from just school parents looking for help, simple help in the schools. That's why I said, why am I answering all these school calls when I don't have an entrance into the school? Because you can't call the school committee because they're in the tank with Menino. They're not doing anything for you. So that's why I think there can be people that are in the school committee, doesn't need to be 13 people, I think three or four people that are available to people that are going to need the sort of services that we provide in a city council district. Someone calls us for heating, for help with food, for help with whatever it is. We're constituent service, quite a bit of it is. There's no constituent service happening in the school department. And that's what I think is an important role in this school committee. It's not there now. I think we're totally overcomplicating with this. And surprise, I'm in lockstep with the mayor on this one. Just thought I'd give you that one. Thank you, <laughs> Council Baker. Thank you, Council Baker. Any, any other discussion on the amendment from Council Flaherty? We're going
going to move for a vote. Mr. Clerk, um, could we do a roll call vote? Point of clarification on the, on the amendment. Uh, on, yeah. well, just, just so people know we're voting the amendment yeah. first. We're doing, we're doing Council Flaherty's amendment first. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed say nay. Nay. Mr. Clerk, can we do a roll call vote? Roll call vote on the amendment filed by Councilor Michael Flaherty. Councilor Arroyo? No. Councilor Arroyo, no. Councilor Baker? Aye. Councilor Baker, aye. Councilor Bach? Nay. Councilor Bach, nay. Councilor Braden? No. Councilor Braden, no. Councilor Coletta? No. Councilor Coletta, no. Councilor Fernandez Anderson? No. Councilor Fernandez Anderson, no. Councilor Flaherty? Yes. Councilor Flaherty, yes. Councilor Flynn? Yes. Councilor Flynn, yes. Councilor Lara? No. Councilor Lara, no. Councilor Lujan? No. Councilor Lujan, no. Councilor Mejia? Councilor Mejia, no. Councilor Murphy? Yes. Councilor Murphy, yes. And Councilor Worrell? No. Councilor Worrell, no. The amendment has failed nine votes in opposition. Thank you, uh, thank you Mr. Clerk. Does anyone else have any amendments or we'll go back to Councilor Arroyo's Docking. No further amendments? Any further discussion on Council Arroyo's docket before we, before we take a vote? Okay, I'm sorry. The Chair recognizes Council Lara. Council Lara, you have the floor. Thank you, President Flynn. I just want to rise um, to share that I'm going to be voting in support of the committee report put forth by the Chair of Government Operations. I think the, I don't want to belabor the point, I think that Councilor Arroyo has really shared much of why this is important and the vision that the people of the City of Boston have set forth for, for us, but I also wanted to really anchor my vote in the historical context of the school committee. When black and brown people in the city of Boston were being shut out from being a part of their municipal government, the elected school committee was really a place where they could go to have their needs and their voices and their concerns heard. Um, particularly around Boston Public Schools. And the transition from an elected school committee to an appointed school committee was in direct response to that power um, that was being built by black and brown communities in the city of Boston uh, and was an attempt to disenfranchise. And so I think that voting for a return to an elected school committee is not only a racial justice issue, um, specifically for Latino communities who make up the majority of the Boston Public Schools students, uh, but it's also an issue of equity and it's an issue of empowering our parents and the people of the city of Boston to really uh, have people that they can hold accountable. I'm in full agreement with uh, my colleague, Councillor Baker, to what constituent services looks like inside of BPS. And I think that that's the reason why the model with the representatives from each district and the at-large councillors is going to be impactful. Because there's always going to be someone who you can go to to talk about not only your child's direct needs, but the needs of your school um, and the school community. Uh, so I am really excited to vote in favor and I really urge my colleagues to uh, move this forward today. Thank you. Thank you, Council Lara. The Chair recognizes Council Coletta. Council Coletta, you have the floor. Thank you, Council President Flynn. Um, I rise to also share that I will be voting in support of this proposal. I do want to commend Chair Arroyo for his leadership in suiting this proposal through the Government Operations Committee as well as Councilor Mejia for your leadership. Thank you so much. Um, I also want to thank the advocates who worked on the ballot initiative that showed that a majority of voters want an elected school committee to represent them. Um, and I have also been transparent with the fact that I have gone on record that I shared reservations about an all elected school committee. But I've since then changed my tune uh, because I believe that this is a solid proposal. We live in a very different political reality in 2023 than in the 1970s and 1980s. Systems and structures that historically marginalized power in Boston's neighborhoods are breaking down. Voters have the ability to readily access information and support candidates they believe will best serve their interests and needs on an elected body. We can trust that credible candidates will emerge and that they will be successful. 
So after analyzing the school committee structures across cities and towns, fully understanding how this mo model empowers communities and trust them, I think that's an important word here, we will trust the voters to make the right decisions for the children's education and defining the legal framework for what works best for Boston, I think that this is a solid way forward. So for these reasons, I will be voting to pass this piece of legislation today, and I urge my colleagues as well. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Cleta. The chair recognizes Councilor Bork. Councilor Bork, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I, I'm going to be casting my what I think is the first present vote that I've casted in this body, and so I just wanted to explain to the body why. Um, Councilor Arroyo alluded to sort of where we all were in prior elections. I was certainly clear about my support for a hybrid. Um, I kind of share the view that what we currently have, I don't think is accountable enough for a lot of reasons colleagues have said. Um, at the same time, I will just say that what I have consistently heard from my constituents is a desire for stakeholder accountability. Um, and so I've heard people saying, you know, I want, I want parents specifically rec represented on the school committee. I want the special ed voice. I've heard increasingly I want the English language learner voice. One of the things we've actually talked about in participatory budgeting, right, and is how do you make sure that representatives are kind of representative of the key stakeholders that you're trying to elevate. Um, and one of the reasons I just voted against Councillor Flaherty's amendment is that I think that um, I, I, between elected, would favor actually more district <coughs> rather than at large because I think that, you know, at large the, the concern is that if you're the lowest information election on a down ballot, then you just worry that name recognition, et cetera, becomes the focus point. And I think the more that people are able to talk directly to constituents, right, the more that that isn't the dynamic. But to me, the ideal, like, districts would not be our districts. They would have more to do with these, like, with the various kind of, like, key stakeholder groups of the schools. Um, that's, like, where I am on this. But also, there was a question three on the ballot last year. Um, I didn't endorse it, but as has been mentioned re repeatedly, it's passed overwhelmingly. Um, Non-binding, again, I've had conversations with constituents who are like, yeah, I voted for that, or really, but like, I want a hybrid. So, I mean, people, I think, had a lot of different views. Um, but I think, obviously, the plain language of the, of the um, question heads in an elected p direction. And I understand what Councillor Arroyo, as the chair, is trying to do here, which is to have the council codify that, uh, that like, desire that was expressed in the, in the ballot question. Um, at the same time, I will just say that I am hesitant for the council to pursue the home rule petition process in a way that sort of doesn't acknowledge the fact that whereas regular ordinances can be passed over the mayor's objection with a two-thirds majority, home rule petitions cannot, which means that a home rule petition that doesn't have the consent of the mayor, no matter how many votes it gets in this council, um, will not proceed to the legislature. I think we should be like straightforward with constituents about that. We've got a number of home rule petitions that are coming down the pike. Um, and when I think about legislative time, I think that we need to start our engagement on home rule petitions from the perspective of how do we, the council and the mayor, get to yes together. Because I think otherwise we risk both confusing constituents about what has actually passed and like what's moving forward, and also kind of like, you know, making people feel as though we've sort of frustrated them in terms of the time that we're spending legislatively on things. Um, so for that reason, for me, if I'm backing a home rule petition specifically, I want it to be one where I see it with a path to actually going to the legislature. And that's kind of like a broader legislative point. Um, but the reason I'm voting president instead of no is because I acknowledge the really, like, that, that strong argument for the fact that there was overwhelming support for the ballot question and that that deserves ex, um, expression by this body. So that's where I am. I will be voting. If, if we do go forward with the petition, I, I do think that any student member who gives up their Wednesday nights um, should get to have a vote after listening to all the presentations and digging in. So I'll be voting as a separate docket, but in support of that. Um, but I just wanted to explain, M Mr. President, how I'll be voting today. Thank you. Thank you, Council Buck. On, on this docket, I want to make sure everyone's voice is heard. So if you go over the three minute mark, that's, that's not a problem. The chair recognizes Councilor, I'm not sure who is next, but Councilor Louis Jean. Councilor Louis Jean. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, I will be voting in favor of this uh, home rule petition. Uh, when we're a unicorn, we have to ask why we're a unicorn? Why are we the only municipality? in the Commonwealth that doesn't have an elected school committee, especially when Boston voters in every precinct and every ward 
uh, sent a resounding message with 79% um, in support of question three. And so I think that it is important that we do the work of the people. Uh, Elected school committees place the power of community representation, representation back into communities, allowing the people from diverse backgrounds to have their voices heard and for those in power to be held accountable. Um, and so I'm on record with a lot of what my colleagues have already stated. I, I don't think an elected school committee is going to be it's the magic bullet to the problems that we face here in BPS, but I think it adds to the accountability that folks are asking for. It adds to the transparency. It makes it more centered on democratic principles. And so I think it is important that we send a message, even if it is just a message uh, to the State House, that this is something that we support and we in Boston should not be treated any differently, um, especially when, we, when, when the state tries to look at us differently with the misguided attempt at uh, take, uh, receivership that we saw last year. So voters are saying that something has to change, and one of the things that has to change is the structure of the school committee to an elected school committee. Um, and so it would be wise for us to carry out the will of the people. I really rise because of the student voters, uh, the, students on, um, the students on school committee. I, while I didn't agree with your amendment, Council Flaherty, I do really appreciate that you included in there that there would be two voting student members. Like Council Bach just stated, we should not force these kids, right, to give up their time on a Wednesday evening and not allow them to vote. It's tokenizing their vote, it's marginalizing their voice, and we should be, if we really want to have a student on the, on the school committee, we should honor that by giving them the right to vote um, on the school committee. It can't just be symbolic, it has to be meaningful. And one student alone on the school committee can be a very isolating experience. It can be very condescending. There can be a lot of sense of, of isolation. And so having another student there is really important to help buttress that student, vo uh, that student voice. If we're talking about our schools, at the center of that should be our students. I know that this is the next docket, but they go hand in hand. So I want to thank the chair for um, his work here and for accommodating some, some language changes to make sure that we are uh, doing everything we can to maximize um, giving rights to our students on school committee to vote. We're talking about their future. We're talking about a school, uh, our Boston Public Schools, majority black and brown. If we're having students spend their time on school committee, it should be meaningful. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Council Louis Jean. The chair recognizes Council Mejia. Council Mejia, you have the floor. Uh, I'm going to defer my time to Councilor Anderson. Thank you. The chair recognizes Council Fernandez Anderson. Um, thank you, Mr. President. I echo what my colleagues are saying and um, to the chair. Thank you so much again, uh, echoing my colleague's comment. Thank you again for your leadership. I'm uh, really uh, impressed by how you've handled this thus far. And uh, thank you to my council colleague, Ms. Uh, Mike Flaherty, for uh, your proposal. Um, I do disagree with the numbers, but um, so I didn't vote in favor, of course. Um, but here we saw um, the vote go um, against the Office of Participatory Budget last uh, week about in, in, in terms of siding with the community and what the advocates were asking for. And here we are again with politics talking about rationalizing our way out of a vote. And I think that you know either we're voting no and we're, we're, we're doing that and we're saying like this doesn't make any sense, but to do, to, to, in order for us to say, you know, oh, the mayor is not going to support this anyway, so we're not going to go to uh, the state. Look, we, we, we would if you vote. So I think that today we can see how, how these votes are siding and how they're shifting and how they, and who here is a, a line, aligning themselves a certain way. Um, and that's fine, um, I guess not personal, but meanwhile, the people of Boston and the children of Boston are, will continue to suffer and lack representation. Yeah, it's not a silver bullet, it won't fix our problems. I agree with Councilor Lujen. Um, however, it is a step in the right direction. So we do the work and we talk about this and we hold hearings and working sessions and then uh, politics happen and then we do not succeed with these votes. So we'll continue to uh, fight on and see how we can have these conversations more transparently. The people of Boston, we owe it to the people of Boston and hopefully we can um, be able to be courageous in standing for what is right uh, as, as, as uh, opposed to playing politics. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Council Fernandez, Fernandez Anderson. The chair recognizes Council Mejia. Council Mejia, you have the floor. 
And I think my colleagues kind of had said it all. I, there was just something that I, I wanted to bring into the chambers is that at the end of the day, we were all elected, including the mayor, to represent the people. And I think that this is a really important part for us to recognize that those who put us in office expect us to do the work. And you know, th this is not a moment to cop out. This is a moment to rise up and say, let's deliver. And I, I really do appreciate the notion that things usually go to die in the State House. But this is one of those opportunities that we have to show what is possible. And I remain incredibly hopeful that the mayor will recognize that this is her opportunity um, to deliver on that mandate um, and to continue to build trust. Because this is why people do not trust government. It's because we say one thing and do another. And so if we're really serious about doing the work, then this is an opportunity for us to show what it looks like to have political courage, to believe that people can decide for themselves who they want to elect to represent them and to hold them accountable. So I am going to ask my colleagues to do right um, and to consider voting in favor and then not just getting it to the mayor for signature, but then to doing the work to make sure that it gets through the state house because that's where the real work begins. So this is just one step in that direction. And the work that we're going to have to do is the next step, right? So I just, I just want to continue to remind people that the real power lies with the people and we can't continue to think um, that you are powerless. So if we're really serious about amplifying your voice, this is an opportunity for us to show what that looks like. Thank you. Thank you, Council Mejia. Would anyone else like to speak on this matter? I'm going to speak next, but if anyone wants to speak before me, um, please let me know. President Flynn, you have the floor. Thank you, Council Braden. I want to say thank you to the Chair and to Council Mejia, their leadership. Now is not the time to make a major change in the governance of our public school system. Mayor Wu and Superintendent Skipper deserve a chance to show us what they can do. I think there needs to be a strong and powerful role for the mayor, and that's about accountability in our school committee structure. If after a reasonable amount of time, we feel that there needs to be a change in school governance, I would favor some combination of appointed and elected school committee members. I think Councilor Flaherty had a reasonable proposal. I supported Council of Flaherty's proposal because I thought it was, I thought it was reasonable. I didn't think, I didn't agree with everything on it, but he came to the table and offered something as a solution or as a compromise. And just want to thank my, my colleague as well. Unfortunately, the hybrid option was not on the ballot in November even though polls showed it to have more support than either an appointed or a fully elected committee. So the hybrid option was not on the ballot, even though the polls said that was the number one pick. It is important for us to work together and provide our public school students the best possible education that we can. I'm going to be voting no. Thank you, Council Braden. <laughs> Council Arroyo seeks acceptance of the committee report in passage of docket. 0135 in a new draft. All those in favor say aye. Aye. 
All opposed say nay. Nay. Mr. Clerk, can we do a roll call vote, please? Roll call vote on docket number 0135. Councilor Arroyo? Yes. Councilor Arroyo? Yes. Councilor Baker? No. Councilor Baker? No. Councilor Bach? Present. Councilor Bach? Present. Councilor Braden? Yes. Councilor Braden? Yes. Councilor Coletta? Yes. Councilor Coletta? Yes. Councilor Fernandez Anderson? Yes. Councilor Fernandez Anderson? Yes. Councilor Flaherty? No. Councilor Flaherty? No. Councilor Flynn? No. Councilor Flynn? No. Councilor Lara? Council Lara, yes. Council Louis Yes. Council Louis yes. Councilor Mejia? Si. Councilor Mejia, si. Councilor Murphy? No. Councilor Murphy, no. And Councilor Worrell? No. Councilor Worrell, no. Docket number 0135 has received seven votes in support. I'm, I'm not going to allow a recess now. I want, I want to continue with the next with the next docket. We are now taking things out of, yeah, we are now taking things out of order since Council Royal would like to pull docket 0406 out of the green sheet. Mr. Kirk, would you please read docket 0406 into the record? On the from the Committee on Government Operations, docket number 0406, petition for a special law regarding an act ext establishing student voting on the Boston School Committee. Mr. Kirk, can you please poll the committee members to see if they would like the docket to come before the body? Committee on Government Operations, Council Arroyo? Yes. Council Louis Yen? Yes. Council Worrell? Yes. Council Mejia? Council Bach? Yes. Council Flaherty? Yes. And Council Coletta? Yes. This docket 0406 is now properly before the body. Council Arroyo, you have the floor. Thank you. <coughs> Councilor Flynn, this allowed. Uh, Separating these two into two separate home rule petitions allows this uh, body to consider these two separate questions. Uh, essentially, uh, the first question was uh, the moving in the direction of an elected school committee. Uh, the second question is whether or not the appointed members of that student, uh, of that school committee, the student members should have a right to vote. Uh, on top of that, this doubles the amount of student membership based on feedback. Uh, that we received during the working session, specifically Councilor Louis Jen, uh, who I think rightfully pointed out that just having a solitary single voice of a student is an isolating experience. And so what this would do, what this home rule petition does, is it creates two voting student members who would join the school committee uh, in its elected form. It gives them the right to vote. I had uh, members of this council uh, essentially state that they believe that one of these issues had sort of been vetted by voters. The other issue had not really been vetted by voters, and they, they felt uncomfortable including them in, in one, uh, one home rule petition. This allows them to go up separately, to be considered separately on their merits. You can be for a elected school committee, but opposed to students having the right to vote on a school committee. Uh, and so this is a separate question that would essentially create two uh, student members with an alternate student who would take the place of either of those student members on <coughs> moments or occasions or on times when they're not there to serve or unable to serve, it would give them a one-year term. Uh, in in <clears throat> other words, from June 1st until the end of that school year. So they would have one-year terms. Uh, and this would do uh, the work of creating a home rule petition that we would then send up to add two additional voting members. On the home rule petition that we just addressed, that did up the number of student representation but did not empower them to vote. If this gets passed, along with that, then this would supplement that. Essentially, this would replace those two student voting members, those two student non-voting members with these two student voting members. It's not an addition to, it would replace them um, with these two voting members. Everything else stays the same. The method of their selection, the, the amount of time on their terms, uh, the alternate, everything else is identical. The only thing that would change is that if this passes along with that elected school committee, then what ends up happening is that those non-voting students are replaced by voting students, but it, it could be the same exact students that would just be given voting powers. And so uh, it's very straightforward. This is a, a vote to 
uh, make it so that the student members on the school committee are both doubled. Uh, right now it's one to two, and that they both have the right to vote. Thank you, Council Royal. Would anyone like to speak on this matter? Council of Royal moves for passage of docket 0406. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. Nay. Got the vote. Mr. Clerk, can we do a roll call vote, please? Roll call vote on docket number 0406. Council Arroyo. Yes. Council Arroyo, yes. Council Baker. No. Council Baker, no. Council Bach. Yes. Council Bach, yes. Council Braden. Yes. Council Braden, yes. Council Coletta. Yes. Council Coletta, yes. Council yes. Fernandez Anderson. Council Fernandez Anderson, yes. Council Flaherty, yes. Council Flaherty, yes. Council Flynn, no. Council Flynn, no. Council Lara, yes. Council Lara, yes. Council Louis Jen, yes. Council Louis Jen, yes. Council Mejia, yes. Council Mejia, yes. Council Murphy, yes. Council Murphy, yes. And Council Worrell, yes. Council Worrell, yes. Docket number 0406 has received 11 votes in the affirmative. Thank, thank you, Mr. Clerk. This docket has passed. Matt has recently heard for possible action. Mr. Clerk, please read docket 0362 through 0365 in dockets 0370 to 0373. <clears throat> Docket number 0362, message in order to reduce the fiscal year 23 appropriation for the reserve for collective bargaining by $164,448 to provide funding for the Boston School Department for fiscal year 23 increase contained within the collective bargaining agreement between the Boston Schools and the New England Police Benevolent Association, Local, 16, local 160. Boston School Police Patrol, Patrolmen's Association. Docket number 0363, message in order of approving a supplemental appropriation for the Boston School Department for fiscal year 23 in the amount of $164,448 to cover the fiscal year 23 costs contained within the collective bargaining agreements between the Boston Schools and the New England Police Belevena Association, Local 160. Boston School Police Patrolmen's Association. The terms of the contract are September 1st, 2020 through August 31st, 2024. The major provisions of the contracts include base wage increases of 2%, 2.5%, 2.5% and 2.5% to be given in October of each fiscal year of the, current, of the contract term. Docket number 0364. Message in order to reduce the fiscal year 23 appropriation for the reserve of collective bargaining by $1,283,486 to provide funding for the Boston Public Schools and the City Housing Trust Fund for fiscal year 23 costs contained within the collective bargaining agreement between the Boston School Committee and Local 1952, Painters Allied Trades, District Council number 35, school custodians. Docket number 0365, message in order approving a supplemental appropriation of $1,283,486 to cover the fiscal year 23 costs contained within the collective bargaining agreement between the Boston School Committee and Local 1952, Painters and Allied Trades, District Council number 35 school custodians. The terms of the contracts are September 1st, 2020 through August 31st, 2026. The major provisions of the contracts include base wage increases of 2% in September and then a base wage increase of 2.5% to be given in September of 2022, 2023, and 2024. And then a base wage of 2% to be given in September 2024 and 2025. Docket number 0370. Message in order for your approval in order to reduce fiscal year 23 appropriation for the reserve for collective bargaining by $1,079,770 to 
to provide funding for the Boston Public Schools for fiscal year 23 increases contained within the collective bargaining agreements between the Boston Public Schools and the United Steelworkers Local 2936 bus monitors. Docket number 0371. <clears throat> Message in order for the supplemental appropriation of for the Boston Public School Department in fiscal year 23 in the amount of $1,079,770 to cover the fiscal year 23 costs contained within the collective bargaining agreements between the Boston Public Schools and the United Steelworkers Local 2936 bus monitors. The terms of the contracts are July 1st, 2020 through June 30th, 2025. A base wage increase of 1.5% in September 2021 and rate adjustments in September 2022. And then a base wage of 2% to be given in September 2023 and 2024. Docket number 0372, message in order for your approval in order to reduce the fiscal year 23 appropriation for the reserve for collective bargaining by $703,939 to provide funding for the Boston Public Schools for the fiscal year 23 increases contained within the collective bargaining agreements between the Boston Public Schools and the Administrative Guild, SEIU Local 888, and docket number 0373. Message in order for the supplemental appropriation order for the Boston Public Schools Department for fiscal year 23 in the amount of $703,939 to cover the fiscal year 23 cost items contained within the collective bargaining agreements between the Boston Public Schools and the Administrative Guild, SEIU Local 888. The terms of the contracts are September 1st, 2020 through August 31st, 2024. The major provisions of the contracts include base wage increases of 2%, 2.5%, 2.5% and 2.5% to be given in September of each fiscal year of the contract term. Thank you, Mr. Clark. The chair recognizes Council Block, the chair of the Committee on City Services, Innovation Technology. Council Block, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Mr. President, um, and thank you to the clerk for reading all eight of those dockets. Um, uh, per usual, there are two dockets each for um, resolved collective bargaining agreements, in this case, all um, workers who work for the Boston Public Schools. We've got clerical workers, our school safety workers, our custodians, um, and our bus monitors. Um, so it's quite a lot of the support staff of the schools. Um, and uh, we're grateful to have David Bloom uh, and Jeremiah Hassan from BPS and then Jim Williamson from the Budget Office join us um, at this hearing on Monday morning. Also, thank you to my colleague, Councillor Murphy, for coming um, and Councillor Flynn for sending an absence letter. Um, I actually would really commend to people uh, our central staffer, Megan Cavanaugh's excellent um, transcribing of the various terms of all four of these contracts because it's set forth pretty clearly in the committee report on your desk. Um, so I will. I will speak to them, but I just want to commend Megan for making a very complicated thing pretty clear. Um, basically, most of these contracts, well, all of these contracts are reaching back to September 2020, um, which means that even that the um, numbers, the pattern that's sort of been set in BPS uh, on the, for the custodians, the um, uh, school safety officers and the clerical workers of 2%, 2.5%, 2.5%, and 2.5% over four years. Those are, three of those four years are already retroactive, and the fourth one is sort of in progress now. What that means is that when you compound those four numbers, but like in September of, by September of this year, the all of these workers, their salaries will be 9.8% up from where their salaries are today. So it does represent a pretty substantial increase that reflects kind of the inflation, obviously, that everybody's been experiencing. Um, and of course, also reaches back and applies uh, in those staggered year ways to um, retroactive pay. Um, the, I'm going to leave for, um, so, well, I'll speak to each of them. So that's the broad pattern. You'll notice that the custodian's contract runs two years longer. Um, that's because there was collective agreement around the table that they were pretty happy with the contract and so chose to extend it out for another two years at 2%, 2%. So that's the one that runs through September 25. Um, you'll see uh, in your committee report a reference um, to a COVID market adjustment for the bus monitors. 
the bus monitors are the one of these four um, where the administration recognized that the just the overall pay for bus monitors is just way out of whack with the market, and it's a big part of the reason why we're seeing us not have enough bus monitors and folks not showing up, and then both our kids with IEPs don't get to school, often a whole bus gets delayed, it's like a major system-wide problem, um, and you know, there's even a temporary residency waiver in place for the bus monitors right now until they get the um, hiring up to at least 85% of the spots, but we're well shy of that. Uh, so the idea here is that besides just the sort of step increases, that there's a significant adjustment upwards for um, wages for bus monitors, and that also what will be achieved this year is a shift for bus monitors from being paid per run to being paid an hourly rate, um, which is also going to make it more competitive. Um, so since I think everyone on the council has dealt directly with constituent um, challenges related to the bus monitor shortage, I think that's definitely good news. Um, there is the $1,000 lump sum payment that's been going to um, uh, unionized city workers who were with us during COVID um, for the for the clerical workers, custodians, um, and uh, the one other, I think that's most of the notes on all of these. Um, oh yeah, well, and for the school safety officers, so all the full-time employees, the bus monitors are obviously not full-time employees um, of the district. Uh, and then there were a few other little things, so I think the council's gotten used to seeing that Juneteenth gets codified as a holiday, um, in the case of the custodians, um, there's a particular system for kind of like big buildings um, that are sort of labeled challenge buildings, buildings with like a lot of old infrastructure, et cetera, where we have a multitude of custodians. Um, the reform in the contract is both going to allow the administration more control over picking kind of senior custodians on a merit-based system and, and not just strictly by seniority, but it's also going to um, compensate people more for some of the particularly tricky work in those challenge buildings. Um, there was an employee sick bank established for the uh, custodians, and then actually over on the bus monitor side, although it's not full-time work for the city, um, there was some paid time off added uh, for the bus monitors during winter break and a choice of either February or April break. And I think that's really in recognition of the fact that even though it's not full-time work, we're competing with other full-time opportunities. And so, well, often our bus monitors are combining this with other aspects of their life. It obviously needs to be competitive and needs to um, give them some time off, which everyone deserves. Um, so I think that those are the main provisions. Um, I will say that I stressed on behalf of the committee, uh, should the council support um, my recommendation that we have to pass these dockets today, uh, that we really need to see this pay actually um, go out to our uh, to our workers, as was discussed at the council meeting last week, um, and that the committee is requesting kind of interim reports on how close we are to that when we've actually gotten that money out into people's pay packets, um, because again, a lot of these are our lower paid workers in BPS, and so waiting on the city to, to pay them um, what we've agreed that they're owed is not something that we want to see happen. So um, with that, Mr. Um, President, certainly, I would be happy to, if, if you were willing to hear from Councilor Murphy, who was the counselor who joined me at the hearing, um, but uh, I would ask for passage of all eight of these dockets today. Thank you. Thank you, Council Block. The chair recognizes Council Murphy. Council Murphy, thank you have you. the floor. Thank you, Council President Flynn, and thank you, Chair Bach, for the hearing. And I said it there, so I just wanted to rise to um, repeat it today, that I feel like we're in this loop, and we stand up in this chamber or we show up on picket lines and we tell our lower paid and union workers that we want to advocate for them to get more pay and we talk about how it's a very expensive city maybe the most expensive city to live in in the country and we've given three over 370 residency waivers because it's very hard for our lower paid employees to live in the city but then we keep rubber stamping and approving these one and a half, two percent pay increases. So I just want to say I hope that this body, without maybe we say no one of these times, because what we're being told by the budget office at these hearings is, well, it's what the last nine or ten were. So let's just keep. Like, why would it be different if we approve something higher for this union? Others may came, come back. So just hoping that at one of these hearings we say enough and I did echo what you say um, at that hearing that if you were there I can hear you say it can't we do better 
do we're a rich city is one and a half percent pay increase when we know we're already not paying them enough to live here in the city, pay rent, and have a livable wage. So I just wanted to stand to say that. Thank you. Thank you, Council Murphy. Anyone else looking to speak on this matter? Um, let me let me speak very briefly, and then I'll I'll, I'll, I'll send it over to Council Board. Um, I certainly support this. Um, thank you for the important work you did on this council block and your important leadership. I have one question. Do we know, as we're discussing BPS related issues, do we know if those school teachers received their pay that was um, not clarified, not, not processed um, several weeks ago? I know that was a major, major concern. Um, the chair recognizes Councilor Block. Yeah, so um, Mr. President, we did ask on that, and it is a request of the committee as part of the full report. They're supposed to be sending us to tell us about that, along with these, along with giving us the updated schedule for how these would go out. I also know, obviously, that um, Councilor Murphy called for a whole hearing on that topic, so wouldn't look to usurp that, but we just, we did ask that question in the hearing. Um, the one other thing I just wanted to say to Councilor Murphy's point, because I do think it's important, um, and it's something that I've been thinking about as the chair um, of this committee, is just to make the distinction, the pattern that we were talking about um, over like the last year that had mainly been established here for city workers, kind of in, again, those mostly retroactive contracts, the two 1.52 pattern, um, if you compound to that, what you get is 5.6%. And so when we're talking here with BPS to 2.5, 2.5, 2.5, what you get when you compound that is 9.8%. So I do just want to stress for counselors because sometimes the difference between 1.5 and 2 or 2.5, like it doesn't seem like that much. But I would say that from my perspective as the chair, the pattern that we're discussing with BPS today and that's reflected in these orders is almost double what we were talking about last year with the pattern that had been set in the COVID crisis, which was part of Part of what happened, that pattern I think was too low and we expressed the council's feeling on that and it, it reflected the fact that it was kind of begun to be dark bargained at a time when the economy was tanking and everyone was kind of worried about what was viable. Um, so I do just want to reflect on behalf of the committee, I, I take Councilor Murphy's point and I think it's an important thing for the council to like always be focused on, but I do think that in this case that four year pattern is almost doubling the reality of the three year pattern that we've been talking about. So I just wanted to make that distinction for the body. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Council Buck. Anyone else like to speak on this matter before we take a vote? The chair recognizes Council Louis Jean. Council Louis Jean, you have the floor. Yes, I'll be brief. I um, thank you, Madam Chair. I was just trying to have it back to make it to this um, to this hearing, but was not able to. I just want to elevate some of the janitors that my office have, has been meeting with, um, who are really at a point of having to work too many jobs mm -hmm. to make it to make working for the city feasible. So I just rise to thank them for their advocacy and their work and to support, um, you know, the compounding that the Council Bach is talking about is great. I, I think part of that compounding is happening because of the retroactive nature of the pay, if I'm, yeah. So I think going forward, I'm thinking, looking at, I understand the compounding and, and the effect that it will have because of raises that they were sort of owed and not given. Um, and so I, I, I take that point, but I also think that in the future we do need to look at uh, increases in what we're asking people to live off of. So I just want to shout out to the custodians we've been working with. Thank you. Thank you, Council Ujian. The chair recognizes Council Mejia. Council Mejia, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. And I just wanted to acknowledge that EDs, um, who we recognized here today, um, and along others who um, are working here in the city of Boston, not only deserve our advocacy, but you know, we can't keep having the same conversation and expecting different results. At some point, we're going to have to start taking responsibility um, for how we really support folks who are juggling two to three jobs just to stay here in, in the city of Boston. So I just want to rise in support and um, continue to sound the alarm for how unjust this city is. Thank you, Council Mejia. And in, in, in on that note, also, we held a reception, myself and Councilor Fernandez Anderson, this morning a reception for our municipal police security that do a tremendous job in this in this building. So I want to advocate and say thank you to Councilor Fernandez Anderson for hosting this reception with me, but also to thank the municipal police, one of our low, lowest wage workers. And as my colleague said, we need to do a better job 
paying, paying workers. <clears throat> Council Bach seeks acceptance of the committee report in passage of docket 0362. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. The docket is passed. Council Bach seeks acceptance of the committee report in passage of docket 0363. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. The docket has passed. Council Bach seeks acceptance of the committee report Passage of docket 0364. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. The docket is passed. Council Block seeks acceptance of the committee report. Passage of docket 0365. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. The docket has passed. Council Block seeks acceptance of the committee report and passage of docket 0370. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. The ayes have it. The docket is passed. Council Block seeks acceptance of the committee report and passage of docket 0371. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. The docket has passed. Council Block seeks acceptance of the committee report and passage of docket 0372. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. The docket has passed. Council Block seeks acceptance of the committee report and passage of docket 0373. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. The docket has passed. Mr. Clerk, please read docket 0324, please. Docket number 0324, message in order temporarily extending urban renewal plans in the city of Boston until March 31st, 2025, or passage of a proposed relevant home rule petition. Thank you. The chair recognizes Council Baker, the chair of the Committee on Planning, Development, Transportation. Council Baker, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, the Committee on Planning, Development, and Transportation held a public hearing on February 13th, 2023, Monday, to take testimony and consider the same. Um, Councilors present were myself, Council Flynn, thank you, Council Bach, Council Murphy, Council Louisian, and Council Fernandez Anderson. Uh, there are also letters of attendance that were read into record from Councilor Coletta and Councilor Lalara. Uh, present were Arthur Jemison from the BPDA, Chris Breen, Ruben Cantor, and there was another person there. I don't have the name written down. I apologize. The proposed order requests for a two-year extension of the remaining urban renewal plans in alignment with the timeline for legislation considered consideration of the home rule petition, which is currently assigned to the Boston City Council's Committee on Government Operations. The mayor has requested that the extension be granted for the shorter of either a two, uh, two or additional years or passage of the, of the legislation at the BPDA legislation. On April, on, in April, 2016, the City Council granted approval of six of a six-year extension for the urban renewal plans, um, 14 urban renewal plans, which were subsequently approved in the Department of Housing and Community Development. In March 20, 2022, the BPDA Council and DHCD sunset two additional urban renewal plans. In expiration of the 12 active urban renewal plans before the home rule petition is adopted with protections for transferring existing land use protections would risk dissolution of affordable housing, open space, and other community-oriented land use restrictions, restrictions currently enforced under the plan. In seeking this temporary extension, the BPDA shall focus its urban renewal-related efforts solely on enforcing existing land use restrictions that protect community values. Um, examples, income restrictions, elderly preferences, open space, and other community um, uses by advancing the resiliency, affordable, and equity goals of the city. Based on the documentation and further presentation at the hearings, having considered the same, I respectfully men re recommend that a roll call vote be taken in this matter ought to pass. So basically, we are extending the urban renewal plans because within those plans sits all the LDA, the, the land disposition agreements which govern, which are um, covenants that govern, govern affordable housing in multiple buildings around the city, open space, elderly uses, parking uses. These are the agreements that when we met with them last year, we asked them to get a handle on all your LDAs because last year, 
when we said, well, how many AD, uh, LDAs do you have? They didn't even, they didn't even know. They've since and given, us the, given us the documentation. They've established how many LDAs there are, where they are, what they are. So this, so we don't lose these LDAs, because if, if, if the urban renewal powers went away, the LDAs would go away and we would run the risk of losing a, a, whole, lot of, a whole lot of benefits. And again, I think that this BRA, BPDA, is not the urban renewal BPDA that went into the West End in the 50s and went through trying to put um, I-95 through our neighborhood. So this is, this is all about our LDAs and a, a two-year extension. So thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Council Baker. Would anyone else like to speak on this matter? The chair recognizes Councilor Murphy. Thank you. Just quickly, um, Councilor Baker referenced that last year in the spring, we had asked them to do a deeper dive into these LDAs. And I just wanted to shout out Chris Breen and his team for their um, wonderful presentation that I know we also all got into our emails and the links to all of the information was very informative and will help us moving forward to make better decisions and development across the city. So just wanted to shout out him and his team. Thank you. Thank you, Council Murphy. Mr. Brent, I just wanted to, uh, so Lisa Harrington was general counsel. She was the one's name that I didn't have in my head. Thank you. Thank you, Council Baker. Anyone else want to speak on this matter? Councilor Baker seeks acceptance of the committee report and passage of docket 0324. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. Count the vote, Mr. President. Mr. Clerk, can we do a roll call vote, please? <coughs> roll call vote on docket 0324. <laughs> Councilor Arroyo. Yes. Councilor Arroyo, yes. Councilor Baker. Aye. Councilor Baker, aye. Councilor Bark. Aye. Councilor Bark, aye. Councilor Braden. Yes. Councilor Braden, yes. Councilor Coletta. Councilor Coletta, yes. Councilor Fernandez Anderson. Yes. Councilor Fernandez Anderson, yes. Councilor Flaherty. Yes. Councilor Flaherty, yes. Councilor Flynn. Yes. Councilor Flynn, yes. Councilor Lara. Yes. Councilor Lara, yes. Councilor Louis Yes. Councilor Louis yes. Councilor Mejia. Yes. Councilor Mejia, yes. Councilor Murphy. Yes. Councilor Murphy, yes. And Councilor Worrell. Yes. Councilor Worrell, yes. Docket number 0324 has received a unanimous vote. The docket has passed. Mr. Clerk, can you please read docket 0210, 0325, 0326? Docket number 0210. Message in order authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expend the amount of $1,642,723.10 in the form of a grant for the fiscal year 23 Senator Charles Shannon Jr. Community Safety Initiative awarded by the Mass Executive Office of Public Safety and Security to be administered by the Police Department. The grant will fund regional and multidisciplinary approaches to combat gang, gang violence through coordinated prevention and intervention, law enforcement, prosecution, and reintegration program. Zero, docket number 0325, message in honor authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expend the amount of $1,722,000 $764.20 in the form of a grant for the local fire department projects and grants line item 83240050 of the fiscal year 23 state budget awarded by the Massachusetts Department of Fire Services to be administered by the fire department. The grant will fund decontamination equipment, vehicle and maintenance expenses for the hazard response team at the Boston Fire Department. And docket number 0326, message in order authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expend the amount of $300,000 in the form of a grant for the local fire department project and grants for the fiscal year 23 state budget line item 824050, awarded by Massachusetts Department of Fire Services to be administered by the Boston Fire Department. The grant will fund renovations at Edge, Edge and 8, Ladder 1, and the North End to improve the safety, health, and wellness of firefighters. Thank you. The Chair recognizes Council Flaherty, the Chair on the Committee of Public Safety, Criminal Justice. Council Flaherty, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, we held a hearing uh, yesterday with the Public Safety and Criminal Justice. With respect to Docket 0210, 
Uh, DeMond Bills was in here, uh, as he's been in uh, years past as sort of the coordinator for the Senator Charles E. Shannon Jr. Community Safety Initiative awarded uh, by the Mass Executive Office of Public Safety and Security. Uh, and uh, this particular grant would fund regional and multidisciplinary approaches to combat gang violence through coordinated prevention and intervention, <coughs> law enforcement, prosecution, and reintegration programs. Uh, it was funded by the executive office, as mentioned. Uh, it's modeled actually after the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention Comprehensive Gang Model. Uh, each community receiving the Shannon Grant Funds demonstrates the presence of risk factors for youth and gang violence. Uh, and participants must be, be the eight, between the ages of 10 and 24 years. Historically, many of the organizations funded provide service through positive youth development, trauma-informed, and mental health-focused lens. Uh, we heard public testimony from Michael Cruzo from uh, Project uh, Right, as well as uh, Erica um, uh, from the Boston Centers for Youth and Family, and uh, they're in full support. We learned from DeMond that, uh, on average, there are about 50 organizations that compete and apply for these funds where, in this particular instance, uh, the funding will support 19 of those civic and nonprofit organizations, uh, including um, uh, BMC, BCYF, BPHC, Suffolk DA's Office, Project Right, Mothers for Justice and Equality, just to name a few of, of the 19. So a good program. Uh, we pushed them a little bit on what and find out what the metrics were. Uh, it's the number of folks they service. It's their hours of operation, making sure that nights and weekends are sort of part of that program, so uh, obviously the hearing was attended by several of our colleagues who also had some great questions. So with respect to docket uh, 0210 as chair moving for passage. With respect to docket 0325 and 0326, we had our uh, fire commissioner, Commissioner Burke, Paul Burke was here, um, and it was prior to a very moving event uh, yesterday over at um, uh, Engine 33 and Ladder 15 uh, over at Boylston Street, uh, where uh, the Last Call Foundation uh, and um, uh, firefighter Kennedy's mom was there present uh, and uh, put forward the, the very strong and compelling argument as well as uh, the city of Boston is going to be beneficiaries of uh, more flame retardant uh, hoses, which, as folks remember, uh, believe it or not, nine years ago with uh, firefighter Kennedy and uh, Lieutenant Walsh uh, were killed uh, while waiting for the, uh, their hose to be charged. They called out for charge the line uh, multiple times before it made a and unfortunately, uh, the fire was uh, um, so, uh, and the, the building was engulfed in the fire, uh, and the wind the factors there uh, caused um, the hose to burn through, so they never got water, and sadly, they perished. So, um, uh, Firefighter Kennedy's mom was there, as well as uh, Lieutenant Walsh's family. Very moving ceremony that many of us uh, attended. But in the spirit of that, uh, making sure that this body continues to support our firefighters, making sure they have the equipment uh, necessary to protect life and property uh, and make sure that they get to return uh, back to the firehouse after a call. And this 1.7 uh, million, uh, 1.7, 7, $124,020 grant uh, will be for um, decontamination equipment, uh, vehicle maintenance expenses for HAZ response team, as well as training. Uh, the vehicle's on order. Uh, it's been delayed, so uh, additional grant money in the future will I think pick up the tab for that vehicle, but um, the uh, commissioner explained in detail um, how it works and the level of contaminants, uh, chemicals, et cetera, that uh, the men and women of the fire department are exposed to when they respond to calls. So anything we can do uh, to make uh, their health and wellness and safety uh, better in this grant will go towards that. That's Zark at 0325. And then Zark at 0326, which I, uh, and it's in uh, our colleague, Council Coletta's district, I liken that fire station to uh, sort of a com community policing model. Every time you go by uh, that firehouse on Hanover Street, doors are open, community members are in uh, in the kitchen with the, with the firefighters, uh, residents, uh, tourists. Uh, it's a very popular spot. And uh, because of the health and wealth um, studies that have been done with the kitchen on the first floor with, where the diesel fumes are with the engine and ladder companies uh, departing or coming back as well as the bunker gear and all the things that are stored on the first level. Uh, this is an opportunity like other firehouses where they're moving sort of the meeting quarters, the cafeteria, the kitchen, and the living quarters. They're moving that up to a floor that's not on the floor where uh, the fire apparatus is, which again is a, a move to improve uh, their health and wellness uh, along firefighters. So uh, this grant is a $300,000 grant that will go 
uh, to make necessary uh, renovations in engine eight and ladder one in the north end. So again, as the commissioner had described, a uh, very important function uh, with their charge with, and it's our hope as chair that we're, passage of, uh, we're passing 0325 and 0326 today to give our firefighters again the equipment and be responsive to their health and wellness needs. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Council Flaherty. Com Council Flaherty seeks acceptance of the committee report, passage of Dawkin 0210. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. The docket is passed. Council Flaherty seeks acceptance of the committee report, passage of docket 0325. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. The docket is passed. Council Flaherty seeks acceptance of the committee report, passage of docket 0326. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. <coughs> the docket is passed. Mr. Clerk, we're on to docket 0167. Docket number 0167, order for a hearing on government transparency and accountability towards COVID safety in Boston Public Schools. Thank you. The Chair recognizes Council Mejia, the Chair of the Committee on Education. <coughs> Council Mejia, you have the floor. Thank you. Um, so the committee, I was under the impression this was on the Committee of Education. Okay. I have two committees, so whichever one you said. But on my notes, according to central staff, it was the Committee on Education. So we just need to get some clarity on that, President Flynn. Um, so I just wanted to thank uh, Council, Councilor Louis Jen and Councilor President Flynn for uh, participating in the hearing yesterday. We had letters of support and attendance uh, were sent and read into the uh, record by Councilor uh, Lada, Councilor Aaron Murphy, and Councilor Arroyo. Um, I want to thank the administration officials, Megan Costello, Senior Advisor, BPS, Dr. Sanchez, MD, Medical Director um, of Infectious Disease Bureau of Boston Public Health Commission, uh, Dr. Uh, Denji Lopes, Senior Director of Office of Health Services, Brian Ford, Executive Director of Facilities Management, and Mr. Ostasa Ahmed, who is the Special Project Manager for the Office of Health um, Services for attending the hearing and making a presentation and responding to questions from our council colleagues. The presentation included COVID-19 updates, BPS health services, mitigation strategies, daily BPS, and Boston Public Health uh, Commission meetings to review cases and cluster data, um, wide and free anti-G um, tests, 1.5 million rapid tests provided, 99 on-site COVID-19 and flu clinics and BPS schools, five community events, clinics at BPS bus yards. Basically, um, Boston Public Schools really kind of gave us a thorough analysis of the work that they have been doing to try to help support um, students as they transition back to school in between um, holiday breaks. Uh, what we heard from our community panel um, is that we need to do a better job. We had uh, the community panelists were Suleika Soto, um, Mary Dabinga, Al Vega. Um, we also had John Mudd, Jakira Rogers, and Julia Raffin alongside Jonathan um, Haynes that joined us uh, to amplify the need to do more. The community and institutional leaders and advocates made presentations that included their personal com um, community and organizational backgrounds and their efforts and experiences promoting access, participation, and meaningful actions on these matters. At the current end, and that the current processes and systems are not adequate and need to be changed to create greater government um, transparency and accountability towards COVID safety um, in our Boston public schools. I'm going to quote some of the testimonies presented just so that you all get a sense of what happened yesterday. Um, uh, stakeholder participation in, in public decision making should be the norm in Boston and in any case. However, in light of parents and other mistrust of, of the BPS administration built over the years because of the secrecy and broken promises, it is especially important that this process be transparent and participatory. Additionally, parents and students and school staff and neighbors know that schools and while not technically experts, they are capable not only of visioning, but also of offering useful perspectives and about alternate solutions. Another quote, 
and adequate COVID safety precautions, policies, and practices are our racial equity issues. BPS serves large number of black and brown families, students with disabilities, English language learners, and other students who have faced historical racism, anti-blackness, and, de and de-investment in Boston public schools. Not con 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 I can't pronounce that word. How you pronounce this word? Coincidentally, these pop uh, populations face some of the greatest challenges from COVID-19. Um, what I'm hoping for is that uh, we clearly need to work in partnership on these issues, and I believe that we have the collective talent and willingness to effectively deal with these issues and make positive changes for our children, our families, and our city. Mr. President, I'm requesting that this matter remain in Committee on Education for further action or the Committee of Government Accountability and Transparency. Thank you, Council Mejia. Yes, it was properly in the Education Committee, and Docket 0167 will remain in the Education Committee. Motions, orders, and resolutions. Mr. Clerk, can you please read Docket 0410, please? Docket number 0410, Councilors Graydon and Lujan offer the following. Petition for a special law regarding an act increasing the maximum amount of fines which may be imposed for violations of ordinances and authorizing the City of Boston to place municipal charge liens on certain properties in the City of Boston for non-payment of any local charges, fees, or fines. Thank you. The Chair recognizes Council Braden. Council Braden, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I move to suspend the rules and add Councillor Bach as an original co-sponsor. Hearing no objection, Councillor Bach is, audit, is added. The Chair recognizes Council Braden. Um, two of the most important tools we have to improve the quality of life and the provision of city services for our residents are the ability to establish local ordinances and to hold bad actors accountable. Uh, a section of the Massachusetts General Laws establishes a procedure for non-criminal disposition of local ordinance violations as civil infractions through an administrative process with a maximum fine set at $300 per violation. Boston's power to set, set fines for violations of our ordinances was established in the City Charter of 1854 when the maximum fine was $50. The Charter provision was amended to raise the maximum to $200 in 1976 and again in, to $300 in 1989, nearly three, 35 years ago. In 2005, nearly 20 years ago, uh, the city sent a home rule petition to amend the maximum fine to $1,000, but it never passed uh, in, the, in the State House. To put all of this in perspective, a $50 fine in 1854 is equivalent to $1,700 today. A $200 fine in 1976 is equivalent to $1,000 today. And the current maximum $300 maximum fine as uh, set in 1989 is equivalent to $700 today. The, max, the, the $1,000 maximum the city tried to set in 2005 is equivalent to $1,400 today. Another general law authorizes municipal charge, charges liens on the property for unpaid charges or fees of the owners. Somerville, Lowell, and Framingham each got home rule petitions passed to amend the words to include unpaid charges or fees to unpaid charges, fees, or fines. Cambridge, Chelsea, Everett, Lynn, and Revere have also passed home rule petitions seeking to be granting, granted the same powers, but none have been successful. The general law for all cities and towns was al almost amended as part of a larger Municipal Moderi Modernization Act bill in 2016 to add the words or fines to all uh, Massachusetts cities and towns, but the language was appro approved by the House and not the Senate and was not included in the version that was signed by Governor Baker. This Home Rule petition would do two, th two main things. 
increase the maximum fine for violations of ordinances from $300 to $2,000 and automatically adjust for inflation every five years instead of waiting for another 35 years to amend that. Allow Boston to, to add unpaid fines for ordinances violations to its authority to place municipal charge liens on property. These are small but important steps to give the city power and tools necessary to both keep up with the times and add chronic offenders of our, uh, and hold chronic offenders of our city's ordinances uh, accountable. As we heard in recent conversations by the hearing we had on, on uh, trash disposal and rodent control, etc., our, folk, our colleagues in ISD said very often these fines are, are not are paid, these small fines are paid as just the cost of doing business and nothing act, actually ever improves. So I think this is a, a, a prudent uh, approach to try and hold uh, those offenders accountable. Thank you. Thank you, Council Braden. The Chair recognizes Councillor Coletta. The Chair recognizes, um, okay, Councillor Louis-Jean. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, uh, Councillor Braden, for your work and your uh, advocacy here. We know that there are many large property owners, developers, and corporations that remain undeterred by the minor fines. Um, they pay them as part of the standard operating cost of doing business, as the Councillor just stated, or allow fines to accumulate for months or years without taking action to remedy the violation. Meanwhile, our neighborhoods uh, suffer from a neglect and absentee landlords. Um, it also means that Boston residents have to continue to endure the impact of these violations, including um, uh, problem properties and derelict landlords. The low dollar amount for fines also reduces the efficacy of important tenant protections, uh, laws and regulations, including in the case of a condo conversion where a building owner um, is fined for not informing current tenants of a conversion and their rights. This will not increase or change any of the current fines. It would not result in a change to current fine schedules, and we can make sure that we're taking different ordinances into account and, and the different amounts and different ordinances. But rather, this would give us the opportunity to propose meaningful and specific fines to hold corporations and landlords and developers accountable. Um, these habitual violators don't feel any sort of pain. This money is... Um, negligible to them, and we've heard also from the counselor that it really doesn't affect their bottom line, and uh, it, we've, been, we've been asking for this change for quite some time. So I am looking forward to doing the work here so that we uh, can make sure that people know that the city of Boston isn't joking when we're talking about uh, complying with our ordinances around uh, everything from trash pickup um, to uh, dumpster maintenance that we want to take that seriously. So thank you, Councillor Braden, and I look forward to the work. Thank you. The Chair recognizes Councillor Bach. Councillor Bach, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Mr. President, and I'll be brief since Councillor Braden provided so much of the history, and I'm grateful to join her and Councillor Lee Jen um, as a co-sponsor here. I will just say I think there are few things that are more frustrating to constituents than problem properties that landlords do not maintain that are consistently getting fines from the city and that just don't pay them um, and not only don't pay them but don't take any corrective action right and I think that's the reality is that it's not it's not even just that we want these larger amounts of money it's that if the larger amounts of money were on the table that we would see the corrective action that's really what our neighborhoods are seeking um, and I, I certainly have a number um, of these properties in my district uh, and it's incredibly frustrating that you know as cost of living has gone up on just you know regular folks in the city of Boston that the one thing that we don't have indexed in any way over now like you know centuries is the cost for these like major landholders when they're not holding up their end of their responsibility so I just I think that this is long overdue Councilor Braden and Councilor Lujan explained why um, and it would give us a combined combined frankly with um, a renewed effectiveness of turning these fines into liens on properties, which is another issue um, that's more of a law department um, uh, resolution. Like those two things together, I think would really help us get people to clean up their act. And it's not, um, it's not rocket science what's happening. Unfortunately, I would like to think that our landlords are thinking about how to be a positive member of the community. But when you're talking about problem properties, what you're talking about is somebody doing a cost benefit analysis where they say, it's going to cost me less 
to just ignore these fines or occasionally pay a little bit of them off and get the rest written down, then it's going to cost me to do the right thing. And we just have to flip that cost benefit analysis on its head. Um, and I know that all the property owners in the city who do help hold up their end of the bargain, who do keep their properties clean um, and, and take remedial action when they need to, would also appreciate this. So thank you, Mr. President. And thank you, Council Block. The chair recognizes Council Coletta. Council Coletta, you have the floor. Thank you, President Flynn, and thank you for allowing me to yield my time to the co-sponsors. Um, I would love to add my name, and I want to thank them for their work in holding bad actors accountable and provide us with higher authority and greater authority to lever our power as a municipality. Um, simply put, this enforcement that we have now lacks teeth. And I can't think of a better example than Loftel Hotel in East Boston. It's something that's been brought up on this floor before, but um, it's an industrial building that has sat vacant for about 10 years. Um, it's gone through the permitting process with the BPDA. It was then sold to owners who own multiple properties across uh, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And in that time, um, because it has sat um, just w without any activity, uh, there has been debris that has fallen off the roof, has fallen on the Mary Ellen Walsh Greenway. They refuse to pick up trash. They refuse to shovel their sidewalks. So in a snowy winter, we all know how annoying that is, trying to traverse our streets. And so after many, failure, um, many failures to get them to the table, to even respond to our emails, and get them to act right, uh, we worked with the former administration to put them on the problem property list. And they saw the $300 fine as it's been referenced as a drop in the bucket based on the amount of money that they typically make per year. And so I certainly welcome this proposal. Please count me as, as an ally and partner in this work. And I do look forward to the conversation and discussing the roadmap um, uh, to passage through the State House. Thank you. Thank you, Council Clara. I will speak briefly on this. I want to say thank you to the sponsors. This is an important issue, these quality of life issues, neighborhood service issues are really the nuts and bolts of city government and if there's probably not an issue I've spent more time on than clean streets and that includes working with Council Braden on pest control and in trash removal and illegal dumping is something I see frequently in in Chinatown and I just want to be sure when we do have the working session in government ops that a lot of people, when they do illegal dumping or they do put trash out, it is not necessarily the owner of the building. Sometimes it's people walking by. Sometimes it's tourists. Sometimes um, it's people that are just being lazy. Other times it's illegal dumping, uh, putting their, their trash or construction debris in front of someone's apartment. I see it frequently in Chinatown. Many of you know, I, I, I tell this story frequently, there was a construction guy that took his construction material on, on Tyler Street and just dumped it there in front of someone's house, someone's house. I chased the guy up Tyler Street. He was in a pickup truck. I, he took a left on Beach Street. I took a left on Beach Street. I was running. He took, he took another right and he escaped, escaped down towards West Street, Tremont Street. Um, but if I wasn't there chasing this guy, um, <clears throat> the owner, the landlord, would have been paying for that fee, for that fine. So I just want to make sure we, we do not necessarily blame the, the land, the, the, the owner of the residence, but the, this is a critical issue. So I want to say thank you to my colleagues. Would anyone like to add their name to this matter? Please raise your hand. Mr. Clerk, please add Council Arroyo, Council Coletta, Council Flaherty, Council Lara, Council Mejia, Council Murphy, Council Worrell. Please add the chair. This docket 0410 will be referred to the Committee on Government Operations. <coughs> Mr. Clerk, please read docket 0411. Docket number 0411, Councillor Flynn offered the following. Resolution in support of designated Lunar New Year as an official holiday in the city of Boston. The chair recognizes Councillor Flynn. Councillor Flynn, you have the floor. Thank you, Council Braden. Council Braden, may I add? Council Louis Jean, please. Uh, seeing, hearing no objections, you may add, we will add Councillor Louis Jean. 
Thank you, Council Braden. This is a resolution in support of designating Wood and New Year as an official City of Boston holiday. As you know, Wood and New Year is one of the most important holidays for our AAPI community here in Boston and across the country. And it begins on the second new moon after winter solace. In Boston, we certainly have a large number of AAPI residents who celebrate Moon and New Year every year with numerous lion dances, banquets, other events to celebrate their proud history. The AAPI community is an integral part of our city and our society. They are our neighbors, frontline workers, healthcare workers, school teachers, small business owners, policymakers, military members, youth sports coaches, among many others. Lunar New Year is designated as a state holiday in California. And in New York City, the New York City Council recently voted to make Lunar New Year an official school holiday. And there is a bill in Congress to designate Lunar New Year as a federal holiday. There is now an effort with Asian American organizations in Boston and surrounding areas to advocate for Lunar New Year to, to be an official holiday in Boston. The person that brought this to my attention is Gary Yu, who's sitting here to my left, who's a leader in the AAPI community throughout Greater Boston. Thank you, Gary, for bringing this to my attention. Designating Lunar New Year as an official holiday in the city of Boston would be an appropriate way to recognize the positive impacts made by our AAPI neighbors. I understand also that designating a new official holiday may involve logistics or adjusting calendars and even contract negotiations. But I wanted to send an important message of support to the AAPI community on this issue. I hope we can suspend and pass this resolution. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Flynn. I'm just looking at my notes here. Did you wish to add Councillor Murphy as, as, a, as an original co-sponsor? Yes, both Councillor Murphy and Councillor louis -Jean. Councillor louis -Jean. Yeah. thank you. Uh, Councillor louis -Jean, you have the floor. Thank you, uh, thank you Councillor uh, Braden, and thank you, uh, President Flynn, for adding me. Um, this is an important way to stand in solidarity with our API community. I am also in favor of days of rest and celebration, and that's what this would be for something uh, that is so important for our AAPI community, <clears throat> recognizing the new lunar year. And I've had the privilege of, of, of standing with you, Gary, and, and with other members of our community and celebrating it, the centrality of uh, the lunar new year to our AAPI community. And so recognizing an official holiday is a way to make people feel seen in our city, is a way to make people feel included. Oftentimes, um, we know uh, communities of color uh, tend to exist, unfortunately, on the margins. And a way to bring folks in and to make them feel like this, too, is your city and we celebrate you and we see you um, is by making it an official holiday. So I am very happy and proud to stand with you, President Flynn, um, and to stand with our API community. Gary, thank you for your leadership um, and in making sure that we all can celebrate uh, the Lunar New Year. And so I look forward to supporting this and to continuing to stand with our API community. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor louis -Jean. Um Councillor Murphy, you have the floor. Thank you. Um, thank you, Council President Flynn, for adding me. And thank you, Gary, for always including me and the other councillors in all of the things you do, standing up for the AAPI community in the city. Part of Boston's richness is its ability of so many communities to retain their ties to and affection for their ancestry or lands they were born. We are a city of immigrants and those who welcome immigrants, and the AAPI community has been such a vibrant part of our city's fabric for so long, so I definitely want to thank you for that. One in ten Bostonians are Asian Americans, and Asian Americans are the fastest growing single racial group in greater Boston. Our city not only supports the AAPI community, but benefits from you also. So I believe that recognizing Lunar New Year as an official holiday in Boston would further demonstrate the city's support for your community. And like I've said at many of the Chinatown 
um, events and celebrations that one of the ways that I've been able to connect and learn more about your culture is by immersing myself in all of your wonderful celebrations. So thank you for always including me and I'm in support of um, making this an official holiday and recognizing in its past due, so thank you. Thank you, Councillor Mejia. Um, Councillor Bach, you have the floor. Thank you, thank you. Um, I, I, I just wanted to say um, to our uh, community and just have to say I'm definitely excited to support this today. I also, Councillor Flynn alluded to sort of the complexities of obviously both the collective bargaining agreements and then the fact that the state has historically objected to Boston as of sort of 10, 15 years ago, Boston having separate official holidays from the state. So I'm excited that there's like communities in other, um, uh, in other like uh, jurisdictions that are excited about this because I think the opportunity to have that conversation with the state is important. I also just wanted to flag for counselors because something that I've been thinking about for a while that it also feels like with the multicultural multiplicity of Boston, like trying to have a conversation about like, is there some space between the official holiday where our city offices are closed and a regular day. And what I mean by that is like, I think our schools have started moving towards like making sure that people can take their holidays without having to get special permission. I sometimes wonder if like one of the ways that council could start recognizing holidays, even if they're not closed for business, is that we're not gonna have a public hearing on a holiday where we know a lot of people in the community are gonna be at services or, or celebrations. Like, and so maybe there are also ways to think about in the interim, how do we kind of like start living out that sense of celebration of these things, even if we don't have the um, kind of the agreement with the state on the legal jurisdiction. So just wanted to flag that as something that I had been thinking about. But um, thank you, Councillor Flynn, for um, filing this. And thank you to Gary and everyone for being here. And please add my name. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Ball. Councillor Mejia. Um, I just also wanted to rise and, uh, and, and offer my support and thank my colleagues for bringing forth this resolution. I remember when Councillor then, Kim Janey, and I believe it was Councillor Campbell and myself uh, pushed forth to declare Juneteenth a, a holiday here in the city of Boston. And that really set the precedence in terms of what we can and cannot do. So I'm really looking forward to moving this uh, forward in, in a way that is going to celebrate and acknowledge your contribution. As, as a fellow immigrant, I know how important it is to be seen to really be seen, not just through um, gestures, but to really honor who we are and how we show up. So really looking forward to supporting this and moving it along through the council. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Mejia. Is anyone else looking to speak on this matter? Would anyone else like to add their name? Councilor Royo, Councilor Baker, Councilor Bach, Councilor um, Coletta, Councilor Flaherty, Councilor Lara, Councillor Mejia, Councillor Morel, and please add my name. Councillor Flynn seeks suspension of the rules and adoption of docket 0411. All those in favour say aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. This docket has been adopted. Thank you. At the, thank you, Council Braden. At the request of my colleague, Council Bach, uh, we'd like to take a brief recess. And Gary, would you like to come down in, in, in your friends for a photo? And if my colleagues can join us here at the podium.
Thank you, Council Braden. Mr. Clerk, can you please read docket 0412? Docket number 0412, Council Laro, for the following. Order for a hearing to create a renter's, renter's bill of rights for the City of Boston. Thank you. The Chair recognizes Council Alara. Council Alara, you have the floor. Thank you, President Flynn. Um, all of the transformative housing policy, both federal and municipal, has come as a direct response to the people on the ground getting organized and demanding what they deserve from their government. The Chicago Open Housing Movement inspired the 1968 Fair Housing Act. The work of Dorothy May Richardson and the black founders of Cash in Pittsburgh predated the Community Reinvestment Act and inspired the creation of NeighborWorks America. More recently, the new tenant movements for housing justice are challenging the notion that housing is a commodity with demands that frame housing as a fundamental human right in need of protection and investment. They've won rent control and increased renter protections in cities all across the country. The White House blueprint for a renter's bill of rights, this hearing order, and Mayor Wu's home rule petition are all the latest in a long list of government responses to grassroots organizing. Establishing a renter's bill of rights is central to building an inclusive, equitable housing system. Tenants especially are confronted with unequal power dynamics between them and their landlords, leaving them with little agency or protection to overcome rental challenges. Last month, I got a phone call from a constituent about a couple who was living in a storage unit because they have been unable to secure housing. Roxbury has lost one third of its black and brown population and organizations like City Life fight against evictions every day. These are the stories that we hear as counselors and we're responsible for taking action. Codifying the relationship between landlords and tenants will help us take our existing protections, expand them, bolster enforcement mechanisms, and start serving as the shield that our constituents deserve. We plan to co-design a municipal bill of rights with renters in every neighborhood, and I want to invite all of my colleagues, especially district councilors, into a collaborative process. No matter what the state legislature or the mayor decide to do, whether it falls short or it goes far, we have to hold the line here too. And my hope is that this hearing order and the subsequent following work will help get us closer to protecting renters in the city of Boston. Thank you. Thank you, Council Lara. Would anyone else like to speak on this matter? The chair recognizes Council, Col Council Coletta. Thank you, President Flynn. I rise today to thank the sponsor, first as a renter myself. There aren't too many renters that come through this body. I'm ex extremely proud of that, and I want to give a shout out to my lovely small landlord um, who um, is just so wonderful and responsive, so I just wanted to put that on record. Um, but also as a counselor representing a district that sits higher than the city average of renter-occupied units. Uh, due to the exponential growth, growth of District 1 and the rising rents that accompany gentrification, many individuals have faced inhumane practices by landlords that are exploitative and largely impact immigrant communities unfamiliar with our laws and those who do not speak English as their first language. There are ample resources online and organizations like City Life Viva Urbana that advocate on behalf of tenants. However, it, I believe it is a good idea to codify these protections through a renter's bill of rights. We should also move to educate and empower renters through this process, um, which will ultimately create stable, safe, and healthy neighborhoods across Boston. So I just wanted to get up and say thank you to the maker, and I look forward to the conversation. Thank you, Council Clutter. I'm going to go around the, um, the horseshoe um, in, in order, but Council Mahir is next. Council Mahir? Going around the horseshoe? Or yep. We'll go around the horseshoe. Yep. All right. We'll, we'll, we'll change it up a little bit, Council Mahir, right? <laughs> oh, we're at Thank you. Um, thank you, President Flynn, and thank you to the lead sponsor. I am incredibly encouraged, and I rise to not only offer my support, but I'm very enthusiastic about what is possible. Um, in 2021, um, our office worked in deep community with residents across the city of Boston, convening folks around issues of housing, and there was an express desire to really identify ways that we can support renters. And I think that oftentimes the power imbalances between landlords and renters are always at constant odds. So I think this is an opportunity for us to really lean in and support our renters. As someone who um, was a renter for most of my life, um, I just became a homeowner not too long ago. 
Um, and, you know, my mom lives on one side and my brother and I share the other side. And so when we think about how we can not only just make uh, things more uh, financially uh, sustainable for folks who are struggling to make their ends meet, there's just so many things. You know, I think about renters who are afraid to speak their mind. I, I, I get calls from renters who who are complaining about the conditions of their homes, but because they don't feel like they have any protections, really can't speak up. So I'm looking forward to not only supporting this hearing, but really creating a bill of rights that is going to uh, support our renters. So thank you, Councilor Lada, for your leadership and your relentless um, convictions towards really uplifting the power of the people. Thank you. Thank you, Council Mejia. The chair recognizes Council Eugen. Council Eugen, you have the floor. Thank you, President Flynn, and I too want to thank the maker. It's really important that we make sure that tenants know what their rights are. Um, as an attorney working alongside City Life, I spent, I've spent countless hours in housing court trying to convince tenants that they have rights and that they can make counterclaims and that they too can push back against landlords. Many people in the city of Boston and in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts don't even know that only a judge can evict you. A lot of people self-evict the moment that they get a notice to quit or any sort of notice from court or even just a mean text message from a landlord. And so it is incredibly important that we make sure that tenants know what their rights are um, because housing courts are not courts, are not a place that are friendly to tenants, right? There's an information asymmetry, there's a power asymmetry, and so everything that we can do to make sure that tenants have that protection, both Bill of Rights, we need to have a right to counsel here in the Commonwealth, um, everything we can to protect tenants in a system that has so much inequality baked into it. So thank you, and I look forward to working on this alongside the maker. Thank you, Council Eugen. The chair recognizes Council Braden. Council Braden, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I, I want to thank Councillor Lara for bringing this issue forward and rise in support of establishing a renter's bill of rights. Uh, Alston Brighton District 9 has about 80% of our population are renters. Uh, long-term and short-term renters, and our office deals with complaints. Uh, every week we hear complaints. Um, many of the issues stem from uh, unresponsive management companies. Uh, in, the, in the recent big freeze we had, um, uh, people were calling about the fact that their homes, their apartments were flooded and the um, management company's office wasn't even returning their calls. So uh, these are ongoing and persistent and very serious matters and I really look forward to working you, with you all on this uh, Bill of Rights for renters. Thank you. Thank you, Council Braden. The Chair recognizes Council Bork. Council Bork, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Mr. President, thank you to the maker. Please add my name. Um, there's a particular thing that I would love to see us kind of explore as an offshoot or in parallel to this, um, and I think it's always good in the council if we can kind of combine efforts. I think that um, a thing that would make a huge difference for renters in the city of Boston um, without needing state law change would be to establish a model lease and maybe even establish a norm where the same way that landlords had to register with us if they were sending eviction notices so that we got those notices, we also had folks register if they had sort of non-typical provisions in their lease because most people are signing leases without the aid of a lawyer. Um, and I, I would say that whereas in most countries, like the types of things that can be in a lease are kind of regulated, um, here it's very kind of wild west and it can put people um, you know, especially when we're at this incredibly low vacancy rate in the city of Boston, so that if people can secure an apartment, they basically feel like they have to sign the document that's put in front of them. Um, I think that those like non-standard leases and some of the provisions that people slip in are, based on our office's experience, a significant piece of kind of people having a hard time pursuing like their rights as renters. So just wanted to flag that as a potential like kind of parallel direction um, as we talk about renters' rights, sort of making them real and also helping the city really have more visibility on what's happening um, in, in those like two-party contracts. So uh, thank you to the maker and thanks, Mr. President. Thank you, Council Block. The chair recognizes Council Royal. Council Royal, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. I rise in support. Uh, please add my name, uh, Mr. Clerk, to this. Uh, it's <clears throat> well overdue that we have this kind of a document coming from the city. Uh, vast majority of our residents, especially our residents of color, our renters in the city of Boston. Uh, there was a study done uh, by MIT in City Life, Vida Urbana, uh, in 2020, 
uh, regarding evictions in Boston. The title is Evictions in Boston, the Disproportionate Effects of Forced Moves on Communities of Color. And the numbers are startlingly bad. Uh, over two thirds or 70% of market rate eviction filings are in census tracts where the minority, where the majority of residents are people of color, even though only about half of the city's rental housing is in those areas. Uh, over one third or 37% of market rate eviction filings occur in neighborhoods in which a majority of residents are African American and black, though only 18% of rental housing is in those neighborhoods. And during the COVID-19 pandemic and before the evictions moratorium, over three-fourths or 78% of all evictions filed in Boston were in census tracts where the majority of residents are people of color. And so this, to me, is also an uh, equal rights, civil rights issue where we are trying to make sure that residents who are renting, who are living in the city, uh, and frankly, renting in the city of Boston is precarious to begin with simply because of the cost of the housing, that they are also very aware of all of the rights entitled to them. Um, as somebody who's rented in the city of Boston and has sort of relied on uh, organizations that have put something similar forward, but uh, I think having something official come from the city of Boston uh, will go a long way towards making sure that people know that a notice to quit is not an eviction and, and ensuring that folks have a full understanding of what they're entitled to when ha things happen uh, in the places that they are renting, uh, who those responsibilities fall to, what their rights are, who they can appeal to, who they can speak to, uh, to address those issues. And so uh, I rise in support. I will be adding my name to this. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Council. Thank you, Council. The makers. Thank you, Council Royal. Would anyone like to add their name? Please raise the hand. Mr. Kirk, please add Council Royo, Council Bach, Council Braden, Council Coletta, Council Flaherty, Council Louis Jen, Council Mejia, Council Royal, please add the chair. This docket will be referred to the Committee on Housing and Community Development. Mr. Kirk, can you please read docket 0413? <coughs> docket number 0413, Council Baker offer the following. Order for a hearing to discuss district improvement financing from Kosciusko Circle through Morrissey Boulevard Corridor. Thank you. The chair recognizes Council Baker. Council Baker, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. I filed this hearing order to discuss using district improvement financing, a DIF, as a tool to connect in connection with development from Kosciusko Circle through the Morrissey Boulevard Corridor. The former Bayside Expo Center has been, under, has been an underutilized, dedi underutilized site dedicated to parking, creating a barrier for public access to the water and existing green spaces, and adding little vitality or public benefit to the community. The area from Kazusko Circle through Morrissey Boulevard, not just um, corridor, is poised to be completely remade. Not just this parcel, but also the Bank of Boston parcel, the Beasley Building parcel, Channel 56, which is the old WLVI, the McCormick housing development, um, are all parcels that are, that are going to be redeveloped within the next 10 to 15 years, whatever, whatever it is. A diff can be helpful with financial burdens of projects including infrastructure such as side rocks, roads, buildings, renovations, and soft costs such as planning studies in workforce training. Many soft costs are not eligible for bonds, making diff, diff revenues a source to fund to cover costs. It's one of the reasons the diff would, would make the city have some skin in the game when it comes to planning Marcy Boulevard, Marcy Boulevard and Kazusko Circle. You're very familiar with it, Mr. President. It's a sort of a hornet's nest here, and the city needs to be at this table. This would bring the city to the table for, for a planning initiative. Gross taxes valued in this area. Now, what we did is we drew a circle around this area. So Mary Ellen McCormick, Columbia Point Peninsula, the Globe Building, everything there that's up to, to JFK Station on the other side of the highway, which I grew up on that other side of the tracks. I was on the other side of the tracks. The current gross tax value in the area are valid, va valued in around $6.2 million currently for all that land that I, ju that I just discussed. Project rates on the new taxes at, at total build-out will be anywhere from 130 to close to 150 million. That's the projections. And what the DIF looks to do is to take 10% out of there that will go for future needs for the surrounding communities. I look at those needs as workforce training, connecting the neighborhoods along, environmental things, but also big planning studies like the Kazusko, like Kazusko Circle. Again, 10% of future revenues that would be able to stay and remain in, in the community that would, that would add benefit to your community, my community, further down the line into Dorchester, right up into Mattapan, this, this whole part of the city. Uh, 
I'm looking forward for new creative ways to create fu a funding stream that is linked and derived from development, in addition to benefiting surrounding communities, in addition to benefiting the surrounding communities impacted by the developments. Um, and, and like I had mentioned last week, Council Anderson had filed something for District 7. I would like to, and I would work this out with her, to see if we could have a joint, uh, 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 have both dockets heard at the same time. First part of the, of the, of the um, meeting would be what a diff is, what you need to do to position yourself, and then the second part would be what it, what a diff could look like. Would be my actual diff that I want to file as legislation, uh, and this is buy-in from the city. This is literally assessing, saying yes, we like that. We'll set up a diff for you, ten percent of the of the taxes in ten to fifteen years will come in, will be used for some sort of community community. Uh, use whether that's through an upfront bond or I haven't been able to figure out what what the other pathways will be but we're in the middle of talks with the budget and BPDA to see what that could potentially look like thank you mr. president thank you council Baker the chair recognizes council Flaherty council Flaherty you have the floor thank you mr. president uh, I actually grew up on the other side of those tracks uh, that he grew up on so uh, as uh, being born on the old harbor projects. I'll say that Cascusco Circle, um, it's, um, it's outlived its usefulness, uh, it's dangerous, uh, leads to uh, multiple accidents probably daily. It's probably the reason why South Boston and Dorchester car insurance rates are through the roof hmm. from all those suburban commuters that are cutting through that don't know how to na navigate uh, Cascusco Circle. So uh, it's an interesting concept. I've actually done diffs uh, on, during my time here in the council, so I look forward to working with the lead sponsor. Please add my name, Mr. President. Thank you, Council Flaherty. The chair recognizes Council louis -Jean. Council louis -Jean, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Please add my name. Um, uh, last week, uh, Councilor Fernandez Anderson had, uh, proposed this, as Councilor Baker stated, for District 7. I'm also supportive of district increment financing here for Kosciusko Circle and thinking about, about Morrissey Boulevard, especially as we're thinking about flood protections that often are a problem there. I think district, incrementing, uh, district uh, increment financing is an important tool that cities aren't leveraging enough uh, to really, uh, for public-private partnerships and to think about ways that we can realize uh, the tax benefits today from, pu for, from uh, for future projects. So, uh, Councilor Baker, I look forward to working with you on this diff um, and with Councilor Fernandez Anderson uh, to see how we can get more money into our communities for improvements. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Wijan. Anyone else like to speak on this matter? I, I would just like to add, um, <clears throat> Thank you to Council Baker for his important leadership on, on this issue, but especially on transportation issues in and around that critical area. It is dangerous. We, myself and Council Baker share that district, uh, share that area, but Council Baker has really provided tremendous leadership on transportation issues. And Council Baker, recently you worked with Congressman Lynch in getting a $3 million funding for the UMass Boston for their nursing program that'll play a critical role in helping so many people get into, into the nursing program so that they can work at one of these great, great hospitals here in Boston. Thank you, Council Baker. Um, would anyone like to add their name? Please raise your hand. Mr. Clerk, please add Council Arroyo, Council Braden, Council Flaherty, Council Coletta, Council Lara, Council Lujan, Council Mejia, Council Murphy, Council Rell, please add the chair. This doc at 0413 will be referred to the Committee on Planning, <coughs> Development, and Transportation. Mr. Clerk, please read doc, doc at 0414. Docket number 0414, Councilors Braden and Bark offer the following. Order for a hearing regarding targeted coordination of community benefits in the payment in lieu of taxes pilot program. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. The Chair recognizes Council Braden. Council Braden, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I move to suspend the rules and add Councillor Louis-Jean as a co-sponsor. Hearing no objection, Councillor Louis-Jean is added. The Chair recognizes Council Braden. 
Uh, this is a hearing order to specifically discuss the community benefits component of the city's pilot program, where higher education, medical, and cultural institutions help offset their tax exempt status by making available in kind community programs which benefit all of Boston residents in addition to their voluntary cash payments. Uh, a core component when the current uh, pilot program was established was that community benefits should directly benefit all Boston residents, support the city's mission and priorities, emphasize ways in which the city and the institution can collaborate to address shared goals, result in quantifiable services, and that the city must be consistent and transparent in its approach so that institutions may plan accordingly. At the time, the city identified priorities for how pilot participating institutions could help meet long-term policy-based goals in areas of need identified by the city. At that time, these included closing the achievement gap, reducing violent crime, increasing workforce housing, improving city services, creating new jobs, narrowing health disparities, increasing diversity in government, and growing revenue. Now, 10 years into the pilot program, the community benefits provided across institutions tends to vary drastically, and there's room for improvement and standardization. This hearing will focus on how the current structure of the program is working out, and look ahead towards establishing a fair and transparent methodology framework uh, to define consistent, deliverable, and quantifiable community benefits. As our Councillor Flaherty frequently references the fact that we have all these wonderful institutions and that we should be leveraging um, uh, benefits from them to help raise the uh, achievement gaps in our schools and uh, decrease, the, decrease the achievement gaps in our schools and many other, many other benefits that we would have through developing partnerships with these institutions. So this is a timely moment to sort of look at what we've been doing for the past 10 years and how we might improve this, uh, this program. Thank you. Thank you, Council Braden. The Chair recognizes Council Bach. Council Bach, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, and thank you uh, to Council Braden for her leadership on this. Um, it was my privilege to chair the pilot uh, committee last um, council session. And, uh, you know, I think it was a somewhat frustrating experience in that I got first Mayor Walsh and then Mayor Janey to commit to a pilot task force. And then in, we, because of the sort of transitions in leadership, we haven't actually had a renewal of the task force that uh, Councillor Braden just described. Um, we also did get a, the assessing department to agree to do updated valuations um, going back, you know, to those valuations that are a decade old now um, and actually looking at what's on the land, what the improvements are today, um, which I think was a, a really important win and really pushed by the pilot action group. So I want to give them um, credit and thanks. Uh, I really would echo Councillor Braden's comments. I obviously have a huge number of the institutions in my district and they're very valuable. They're valuable to the knowledge economy of not just the city, the state, but the world. Um, they're employers of many of our folks, um, but they are also, they need to be partners in the city of Boston. They need to be partners with city services, with provisions of things like excellent public education. Um, I think that uh, I think that at the time that pilot was originally discussed, there was this kind of conception that the piece of the puzzle that the um, institution should support was fire, police, and snow. The idea being that like that was what they used. And I think the conversations come a long way in the last 10 years. I think everybody recognizes that in fact, our institutions are also built on the question of whether there's great education for our students, like the question of like, you know, our, the quality of our streets, the safety for pedestrians and bicyclists, right? Like a million things that our, uh, our city works on are things that our, our institutions uh, also benefit from and that we need them as partners in. And we really saw what real partnership with the institutions can look like around some of the partnerships in COVID. Some of the like housing and healthcare partnerships were tightly coordinated. It was not a case of a committee somewhere dreaming up what people might need. It was a case of real coordinated like, okay, what do we need and how can everybody pitch in? Um, the hospital, uh, effort to coordinate benefits that's been coordinated through the Attorney General's office in recent years has really like kind of helped to model this and the fact that they both have that and the hospitals are paying 100% of their requested pilot um, is huge and I think we really do want to shift the university sector into that mode. Um, I, I will just say uh, in my 
um, capacity as a historian, you know, some people zoom out and say that the reason for the sacking of the monasteries in France was that they just started to take too much of the land and it was untaxable, right? And so at some point, like, you can't really operate. And I say that somewhat tongue in cheek, but the city of Boston is so dependent on property tax that the more that the amount of the land of the city that is held by nonprofit institutions grows and grows, and we have seen significant in institutional expansion, the more that it threatens the kind of fundamental tax base of the city. And so I think that it's important to think about pilot not just as sort of like the city grasping for more, but really as a conversation about the long-term fiscally responsible sort of foundations of the city and making sure that our institutional partners who are critical to us and who critically rely on the city of Boston um, are really being partners in that funding framework. So looking forward to this conversation um, and very proud to uh, have these institutions in my district and thank you again to Councillor Braden for leading the charge on this. Thanks, Mr. President. Thank you, Council Bok. The chair, the chair recognizes Councillor Louis Jean. Councillor Louis Jean, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. I'm very excited to be working on this with um, Councillor Braden um, and uh, Councillor Box. Thank you. One of the first questions when we talk to um, when my office is engaging with uh, universities, with hospitals, is actually around this very question. Because you know we know that pilot went into effect in 2012, but since then, participation and compliance has really atrophied. And it really takes us doing our job to hold them accountable. And oftentimes, com sometimes community benefits can be uh, used as a smoke screen for compliance. And so one of the questions I, I, I get into is what is the meat of that community, uh, of those community benefits? And are those community benefits that should be provided by these institutions anyways, because they're integral to the identity of the institution. And so in 2019, the pilot action group released a report, Boston's payment in lieu of taxes programs, a fair, de a fair deal for Boston residents, question mark. And uh, we aren't seeing a fair deal from some of our largest institutions. Um, and so I'm excited to hold this hearing um, with uh, the co-sponsors and, and the maker um, so that we can think about what it looks like to standardize community, uh, community benefits so that we can make sure that our residents are really benefiting, that institutions that should be providing community benefits are doing it anyways, regardless of pilot, and that we're not giving them an excuse to say, oh, instead of giving you cash, we're doing this community benefit, but it's a community benefit that, you know, um, as a nonprofit institution, whether it's higher education or in health, uh, that we hope that they would be doing regardless of pilot. So I look forward to this conversation to see that, make sure that we're extracting um, what we should under pilot. Um, as a uh, uh, co-sponsor stated, uh, we rely so heavily on property taxes. This nonprofit status allows very, very wealthy institutions with large endowments uh, to get away with not giving uh, or paying their fair share. So look forward to the conversation. Thank you, Councilor Wijan. Would anyone else like to speak on this matter or sign on to it, please raise your hand. Mr. Clerk, please add Council Arroyo, Council Coletta, Council Flaherty, Council Lara. Please add the chair. Council, please add Council Mejia as well. Um, this docket 0414 will be referred to the Committee on Pilot Agreements, Institutional and Intergovernmental Relations. Mr. Clerk, please read docket 0415, please. Docket number 0415, Councilors Murphy and Baker are for the following. Order for a hearing for the possible closing of several Boston Public Schools and BCYF community centers this summer. Thank you. The Chair recognizes Councilor Murphy. Councilor Murphy, do you have the floor? Thank you, Council President Flynn, and also thank you to my co-sponsor, Councilor Baker. So last week it was brought to my attention that several of our BCYF summer camps will be closed this summer. Facility repairs are needed at many of our Boston public schools and there are tentative plans underway to do HVAC remediation work at several of these schools that are connected to our BCYF centers. As we all know, um, our community centers support children, youth, individuals, seniors, and families through the wide range of programming and services they provide. They offer affordable opportunities to encourage healthy habits, promote physical fitness, and give people an opportunity to learn to swim, exercise in the gyms, participate in activities of all ages, and register for summer camp. We had a hearing that I sponsored 
last year um, of, with the BCYF to make sure that we are getting lifeguard staffing and the facility updates of the pools because we did see last summer many of our BCYF pools were closed and many neighborhoods were left without a place to swim during the summer. The tentative list of schools when, this, when we first heard about this last week to be closed for repairs for this summer were the Murphy, Tynan, Condon, Quincy, and or Orenberger. If all of these locations are closed this summer, there will be hundreds of families displaced across the city who plan on, who have for several years, signed their children up for summer camp, and also many of the youth in our neighborhoods work at these summer camps. And just as a note, the Orenberger Community Center is the community center in our city that hosts Camp Joy, which is the program that provides the summer camp for our special needs children um, ages 3 to 15. For me, this is having departments work together. It's making sure that everyone who will be affected by these changes are at the table and that the communication is um, in place so that nobody feels as though something is happening to them without them being part of that conversation. We know that, and I'm in very big support of making sure that needed repairs at all of our schools across the city happen and are completed in a timely manner. But if any of these repairs have potential impact on summer programming at our community centers, we need to know in advance. So I'm calling this hearing now so that we can make sure that families and workers at all our community centers are aware that this is a possibility. When there is sudden closure of one of these community centers, it creates a disservice to our residents. So we do need to bring all of the stakeholders together to make sure we're communicating between departments and including communities. Since um, I heard of this last week and have talked to some people in different departments, they have been scrambling in trying to get things in place. The list of closures has maybe smaller now but there is still a lot of conversations that need to have. Last we heard the Murphy, Leahy Holler, and summer camp would be closed for two summers, but they would maybe, if licensing and permitting could happen, offer the Perry School. But to me, the community in Neponset, Dorchester, that's 3.8 miles away. So we need to really have a conversation of, is the Perry School comparative to the Murphy community, which has fields next door, a swimming pool, a cafeteria. The Condon and the Tynan both in South Boston, so there is conversation that maybe it will just be the Tynan this summer and the Condon the next so that they could use swing space at the Walsh Center. So I do um, appreciate and know that there are people working hard to get um, answers and to make sure that things are somewhat okay. But asking families in Dorchester District 3 to go to South Boston for a summer camp, which is 3.8 miles away, when I did the measurement, it would be like asking the neighbors and many of the um, children, you know, Council President Flynn and Council of Flaherty at the Condon are um, residents of the D Street projects. Mm -hmm. That would be asking them, because 3.8 miles from the Condon is the Elliott School in the North End. And we do know, Council of Cleta, when we had conversations around the Clarity Pool, that. People in different neighborhoods want to make sure that they can stay in their neighborhood and that their neighborhood has services that they need. So it's definitely going to be a bigger conversation. Will there be buses lined up every morning for, to get our kids to off sites? We do know and appreciate that work needs to be done, but we don't want to be scrambling and we want to make sure that everyone who will be affected, including the young children who are looking forward to working, many of them finally old enough to be camp counselors at these different sites know in advance so that they can prepare for their summer. And we need to make sure that our families know well in advance if that isn't an option for them. So thank you, Council President Flynn. I look forward to the hearing. Thank you. Thank you, Council Murphy. The Chair recognizes Councilor Baker. Councilor Baker, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Council Murphy, for allowing me to join you on this here. We received word last week the Leahy Holland Community Center and the Murphy School would close for two summers for upgrades. Um, and there are others in the plan across the city also. While they appreciate the, the investment in our schools and community centers, there's also been little to no communication and transparency with us in the school community and the, and the administrators. 
Uh, during the summer, the Murphy and the Leahy Hall in our home to summer jobs, camps, daycare, and extended school year learning programs for students with disabilities, including those in wheelchairs. Um, as it stands, there's no real plan to accommodate these programs, and it's only fair that we hold a hearing to hear from the appropriate panels on how the program will not completely disrupt for two years. And again, not that we don't want to go to South Boston, but if we do go to South Boston, how do the people that normally walk down the hill and go to the Murphy, uh, how are they going to get over there? Are we going to provide buses? We're looking for information on what to expect for these new two years. But for me, this is a glaring, this shows a glaring need in Dorchester, in District 3, for a community center. One that we had talked before in the past. We have, we could go to the field house at, at, um, at, at Town Field, but guess what? That's in severe disrepair. That can barely take the, the kids in there that go there every day for their program. So we don't have anything else. We need something else. We need a real, we need a real center in this, part of, in this part of Dorchester. I have a proposal for one. Thank you. Thank you, Council Baker. Would anyone else like to speak on this matter? I also want to acknowledge the work of Council Murphy in highlighting especially the Condon School. As, everyone, as many know, it's in the middle of the West Broadway development. Um, one of the most diverse areas of the city is the West Broadway public housing developments. Um, Councilor Murphy, um, during this hearing, could we also um, include the role of BHA and what impact that would have on um, BHA residents as well? Th um, thank you, Councilor Murphy. Well, would you please raise your hand? To, um, to sign on. Mr. Clerk, please add Council of Royo, Council of Bois, Council of Braden, Council of Coletta, Council of Flaherty, Council of Lara, Council of Louis Council of Mejia. Please add the chair. This docket 0415 will be referred to the Committee on Strong Women, Families, Communities. Mr. Clerk, can you please read docket 0416? Docket number 0416, Councilors Bach and Braden offer the following. Order for a hearing to discuss city services in regard to composting and the need of composting capacity in new construction and large buildings in Boston. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. The chair recognizes Councilor Bach. <coughs> Councilor Bach, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Mr. President. Mr. President, may I suspend Rule 12 and add Councilor Lara as an original co-sponsor? Hearing no objection, Councilor Lara is added. The chair recognizes Councilor Bach. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Um, this is obviously, uh, we've been very excited. We've talked a bunch in the council about the composting rollout that's going. Um, the city pilot, we've started with 10,000 people. There's 7,000 on a wait list. There's another 10,000 to come, another 10,000. And we also, as a council, um, supported funding some permanent municipal composting infrastructure as part of ARPA. Um, there's a kind of missing piece of this puzzle, though, which is that the current composting um, pilot is only for buildings with units, the six units or fewer. Um, and the reasons for that are logistical. If you think about like, you know, 30 of those green bins out front of a big building, it just wouldn't make any sense. Um, but it reflects the fact that we really need our big buildings in Boston to have a plan for dealing with organic waste. It's critical for the zero waste goals of the city and it's also critical from the kind of pest control perspective um, to really like manage that organic waste well. Um, and so, you know, this is really, uh, we've, we've had the composting conversation before with our fantastic team from the Department of Public Works, but they don't have any jurisdiction over what we're asking folks to do when they build new construction, large buildings um, over at the BPDA. And I have found as a counselor, when I'm talking specifically to buildings in my district, that you know, amidst the host of smart utilities requirements and stuff that we have, we really aren't asking people to do anything different with their trash rooms or their practices in order to handle organic waste differently than we were asking them to do 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. And that's just not really gonna work um, in a future where we're handling this waste this food waste much more um, responsibly uh, and we're using it for doing things like generating compost um, and and so you know I think my hope is that the city is building infrastructure such that we're going to be able to have folks from surrounding municipalities and from private like side pay us for the privilege of, of turning their waste into compost like I think that that's a 
uh, kind of hub service that the city of Boston should um, provide and I think could, as, as we've discussed also, Councillor Baker, like could actually like make money out of, could have good city jobs backing. Um, but we need internal infrastructure in these buildings. And so um, this is a slightly different hearing order in that it's actually, it is, it's inviting the public work folks, but it's also inviting the BPDA folks and it's really trying to put us on a path to figuring out what do we have to do as we build the buildings of the future, buildings that we have, you know, we're analyzing on a green building code, like on a host of fronts, how do we actually make this kind of part of it? Because it's very hard to build the infrastructure for handling compost in retrospectively, which is gonna be a challenge for our existing large buildings. Um, so it would be great if we had it front of mind for folks um, as they're building new things. So uh, that is the hearing order. And I really wanna thank Councilors Braden and Laura for co-sponsoring with me. Thank you, Mr. President. Th thank you, Council Buck. The Chair recognizes Council Braden. Council Braden, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you to Councillor Bach for including me as an original co-sponsor. Um, we are seeing an, a huge amount of new development in, in our district, and this issue, we, we have uh, impact advisory groups and uh, public meetings, and this issue comes up a lot with regard to uh, disposal trash management and uh, composting. And even in the existing older uh, buildings that we have, large um, multi-family units, uh, we're getting calls frequently from our residents saying, you know, how, do, how can they participate in our composting program? But I think as we build so much new housing in the city, it's really, really important that we, we, we address this issue up front and make sure that we we're, we're have uh, designing uh, trash disposal and composting am amenities within our buildings to handle this. And this will help mitigate the, uh, the problems that we see with, uh, you know, our food, how we dispose of our food and our waste in our, in our buildings is directly uh, uh, linked to uh, the problems we're having with road management. So I, I look forward to this conversation. I hope we can be, come up with some innovative ideas and that we'll get buy-in from uh, our uh, colleagues in the development community to try and come up with some really good solutions to this problem. Thank you. Thank you, Council Braden. The Chair recognizes Council Olara. Council Olara, you have the floor. Thank you, President Flynn, and thank you to Councillor Bach and Councillor Braden um, for including me and for being co-sponsors on this hearing order. I love compost, and I love composting, and I think that um, the pilot that we have seen in the city has been incredibly, incredibly successful, um, and you can see that based on the long, long wait list that we have. Uh, I was really excited to be a part of the pilot, but because I live in one of these larger buildings, I did not have access to it and have kind of always cringed as somebody who cooks a lot and spends a lot of time in the kitchen at the amount of food waste that I was kind of wasting because my building was unable to participate. Uh, and so I think that our increase in these new developments are, should go hand in hand with increase in our composting capacity. And because we don't currently have any regulations um, or requirements for new buildings, I think that this is the time to take the initiative to set clear standards. And I hope that a hearing is going to help us ascertain what resources we need to make this happen and help us chart a path. Uh, and a blueprint to any future policy. Thank you. Thank you, Council O'Hara. Would anyone else like to speak or add their name? Mr. Quirk, can you please add Council Arroyo, Council Flaherty, Council Louis Council Mejia, Council Murphy, please add the chair. And want to say thank you to the, to the authors of this uh, resolution, this hearing order. My wife and I do participate in the pilot program for composting, and I, I certainly agree with you, Council Braden, if we had a robust um, composting plan, it would be tremendous in, as, as we deal with the crisis of uh, pest control <coughs> related issues across the city. I think we talked about a recent New York Times article about pest control related issues in, in, in New York City, and they're spending significant amounts of money on dealing with pest control, which is a major problem in almost every city across the country. Um, but having a robust composting program would certainly help us as we deal with this pest control crisis as well. So this docket, 0416, will be referred to the Committee on City Services, Innovation Technology. 
Mr. Clerk, please read docket 0417. Docket number 0417, Councils Bach and Flynn offer the following. Order for a hearing to discuss digital equity and municipal broadband in relation to affordable housing in the city of Boston. The Chair recognizes Councilor Bach. Councilor Bach, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Mr. President. May I again suspend Rule 12 and add Councilor Mejia as an original co-sponsor? Hearing no objection, Councilor Mejia is added. The Chair recognizes Council Bach. Thank you, uh, President Flynn, and uh, I'm thrilled that uh, our triumvirate of you, me, and Councillor Mejia can get the band back together again because we have been working on um, pushing digital equity issues together uh, for a number of years now, dating back to last session. Um, and, you know, this is just such a critical issue for the residents of Boston. I like to say that I really feel like, you know, internet and access to fast internet, the kind of internet that lets you access school, work, opportunities, information, civic gatherings, has really become like an, a sort of utility that people need access to for just their daily lives, and yet it's still um, provided in this country in the form of kind of an amenity where you can just get priced out of having access to it. We saw the, that issue in the pandemic really rear its head, um, and I'm really grateful for the series of steps that the city has taken and that this council has supported to kind of push back against that. So um, obviously as part of ARPA, we, we sent some additional money to Tech Goes Home, $2 million, mm -hmm. um, to work with the collective bar, um, with the community-based organizations around the city to get as many Bostonians as possible signed up for the Affordable Connectivity Program, ACP, um, which is the program that the federal government uh, created to basically give the vast majority of low-income people in the country access to 30 bucks a month for internet access and then also to require the providers to have a plan that you can pay for with that. Um, so that's a benefit that we are we already know. There's still a lot of Bostonians who are not signed up for and they should be signed up for it. And so really pushing that information out into our communities in every language is super critical. Um, but I think we also have to ask about infrastructure and what is the quality of internet infrastructure that we have going to all parts of the city. It's a huge deal that in Boston we do have a fiber network, that it runs to all the BHA developments and all of our public schools. It currently runs as kind of to like a node, like the kind of central office of the various BHA developments. Um, but I think the question of how could we provide municipal broadband actually to, um, at the family level, like to individual households uh, is a, is a really exciting one and one that could really change the game for a lot of the folks who continue to be locked out on internet. Um, and so, you know, again, the council, um, and, and thank you to Councillor Mejia for leading on this, I think it was actually the FY22 budget in the summer of 2021, um, funded a, a study, asked the city to basically assess municipal broadband and like what it would cost and what that would look like. Um, and also to do some further data study on top of what the Human Rights Commission had done about uh, the quality of mm. internet access around the city. Um, and so that report was actually completed just this past September. Um, and it's out and it's long and I will say like the council has not had a chance to discuss it and I feel like it's mostly run pretty under the radar. Um, so, you know, one of the points of this hearing is to have, invite, do it and discuss the findings of that report and really discuss next step forward. and. and for me in particular, this question of, I think, there's one question talking about kind of municipal broadband for everyone citywide. It's a slightly different question to say, how could we maybe prioritize getting that to our households in affordable developments? And not just the city-owned ones, but the non-city owned ones, um, and really tackle the problem that way. So I think, you know, we've been pushing this, and thank you to both my co-sponsors for being such great leaders on it, um, and recognizing the nexus with um, racial equity and with language justice um, in this issue. And I think that it's like time to take another step forward um, on this front. So that is the idea of the hearing. And uh, thank you so much, Mr. President. Thank you, Council Buck. Would anyone else like to speak on this matter? The chair recognizes Council Mejia. Council Mejia, you have the floor. Mr. President, and thank you to my colleague, Councillor Bach. Yes, we are. We should take the show on the road here. It was a third year touring right now, President Flynn. Yeah. Um, but no, I'm really excited to not just continue the conversation because I think that, you know, when we think about what's the next step, I, I, I think that it's really an opportunity for us to uh, go beyond the conversation. So I'm hoping that, that now that we secured the funding to be able to do the study, now that we have the results, how do we dive in um, deeper to then figure out when we know better? The question is, is what are we going to do about it? So looking forward to the hearing and more importantly, um, delivering. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Mejia. Would anyone else like to speak on the matter? 
The Chair recognizes Council Flaherty. Council Flaherty, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Please add my name and just through the lead sponsor, just uh, an, an offer of suggestion as we reach out to the existing broadband companies. They actually partner with the city. They're always willing to do more. Oftentimes we sort of like to throw them in a headlock or they feel that uh, it's an us versus them, but they are great partners. They're mm -hmm. some of our city's biggest employers. Uh, we host them in a lot of our neighborhoods. Uh, and so they would love to be part of the solution and it doesn't need to be a you know, whether it's a Comcast versus Verizon or this company versus that company, uh, they'd all be willing, I think, to, to come forward in an effort to try to help us solve uh, sort of the digital divide to provide uh, broad, uh, broadband access uh, across the board. They recognize it's important. It's obviously good business for them. But more importantly, it's a service that they're willing to provide. And they currently do that now, uh, oftentimes off the radar, uh, not looking for any rec uh, recognition uh, whatsoever, in fact. Um, as they continue to make their own technological upgrades uh, and as they compete with one another, Boston's the beneficiary of that. And as we're seeing more buildings coming online, uh, it's largely driven by the fact that they've done that uh, and they've, uh, they've improved their own infrastructure. But uh, it'd be great to you know, call them in and have a conversation, put an ask in, and I'd venture to say that they'd probably be more than receptive and willing to partner with our city uh, as we continue to deal with this issue. Thank you, Mr. President. Please sign my name. Thank you, Council Flaherty. The Chair recognizes Council Braden. Council Braden, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. I, I want to thank the makers for this important uh, uh, hearing order. Um, I have a particular interest in, in thinking about these services for our elders in our senior housing. and. Um, so much of what we do now with in interacting with our healthcare providers is is you know being able to go on a portal and make a doctor's appointment or get feedback or uh, communicate with your primary care uh, even have having virtual um, um, telemedicine appointments all of that in that is, has evolved dramatically and fast in, during the, the uh, during the uh, pandemic and I think it's increasingly important to recognize that this is not a luxury, but this is a necessity for so many of our residents in the city. So I look forward to weighing in on this conversation, and I look forward to advocating for um, and, you know, improving these services across the city. Thank you. Thank you, Council Braden. Would anyone like to add their name? Please raise your hand. Mr. Clark, please add Council of Royal, Council Baker, Council Braden. Councillor Anderson, Fernandez Anderson, Council Flaherty, Council Louis Jen, Councillor Murphy, please add the chair. And just want to echo what my colleagues have mentioned. Tech goes home, plays a critical role. Uh, thank you to Council Bach and Mahi, Council Mejia, and our colleagues who are working with Tech goes home. But also, there's a wonderful organization in my district that does tremendous work <coughs> on this issue, and that's the Castle Square Tenants Association right on the border of the South End in Chinatown. Wonderful community, but that's one of their top issues is advocating for digital equity, not just in their neighborhood, but across the, across the city. So I wanna say thank you to um, the Castle Square tenants for um, their important work <coughs> and leadership on this issue. Docket 0417 will be referred to the Committee on City Services, Innovation Technology. Mr. Quirk, the next docket is 0418. Docket number 0418, Councilor Fernandez Anderson offer the following. Order requesting certain information under 17F regarding the Boston Public Health Commission. Thank you, Mr. Clark. The, the, the Chair recognizes Council Fernandez Anderson. Council Fernandez Anderson, you have the floor. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. I have um, filed 17F to acquire some information about expenditures, but also um, whether or not we are doing this equitably in terms of um, uh, the contracts, but also the employees, and I think it's self-explanatory. I'm um, I filed a hearing order for um, equity on the budget, and in preparation to that, I will need some information to uh, moving forward. And I thought that doing this ahead of the hearing um, would be prove most um, productive. Um, I to the administration, I'm asking that they actually respond to every to every question. Um, and actually provide information on what, why, um, if they can't provide information in response if, uh, to give their reasons why they can't. Um, the last 17 Fs that I filed, you will see that I'll have to file again because the information that I received was com were completely um, 
were incomplete and I am seeking that information again. So when we file 17 Fs here, I'm hoping that they are um, done diligently and accurately and hopefully um, uh, completely, <laughs> and it's not happening that way. What we get back, like for, for example, you'll ask on race, you'll ask on demographics, you'll ask on expenditures, and maybe you'll get one answered, um, one sentence answered, but not the full um, uh, of what you are asking on the 17 F. So um, just asking for that courtesy so that I don't have to continue to refile and refile and have to go on record and come here in this chamber publicly to say that the administration is not properly answering to 17 Fs. Thank you. Thank you, Council fernandez Anderson. Council fernandez Anderson seeks suspension of the rules and passage of docket 0418. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. The docket is passed. Mr. Clerk, please read docket 0419 to please. Docket number 0419, Councilor Murphy offer the following. Order requesting certain information under section 17 F regarding chronic absenteeism in Boston Public Schools for school years 2021 through 2022 and 2022 through 2023. And docket number 0420, Councilor Murphy for the following. Order requesting certain information under section 17F regarding Boston Public Schools sexual assault and misconduct data for school year 20. 21 through 2022 and 2022 through 2023. Thank you. The chair recognizes Council Murphy. Council Murphy, you have the floor and, and you, you'll speak on both matters? I can speak on both. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Council President. And um, thank you, Councilor Fernandez Anderson. I share in your frustration, and that's why I'm again using this tool we have on the Council and hoping that I get the answers we requested. <coughs> so the first one is on the chronic absenteeism in our Boston Public Schools. I do just want to go on record to state that this is not, unfortunately, just a fallout from the pandemic. If you look at the 2012 headline in one of our local newspapers, it said absenteeism rife at Boston <coughs> high schools where we had over almost 50% ab chronic absenteeism. Just for um, a quick overview, DESE, the state, defines chronic absenteeism as students missing 10% or more of the school year. That would be 18 school days. Because Boston and other school districts, but we're, we're only here to talk about Boston, many of them are even more than 20 that they've made a second column on the DESE website so that you can see how many are more than 20%. In the majority, we have a 40% chronic absenteeism here in the city of Austin. So I'm requesting this data to um, help support and move forward with some policy to support the students in the Boston Public Schools. The second 17F follows up on a hearing Councilor Mahir and I had last year where the BPS did give us numbers on sexual assault, misconduct, and other um, discipline that are, um, that the data is recorded on. So I am just asking again, because I've been trying for a while with conversations with the administration to get the breakdown of what the actual misconducts were, and I've listed in the 17F that went along, obviously, to the administration, that it's clear on the EQT-3 superintendent circular that there's a long list of different types of misconduct, and it would be helpful to me to know where, um, what, what types of misconduct we see across the city. So thank you for that. So I hope that my colleagues support my 17Fs. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Council Murphy. Council Murphy seeks suspension of the rules and, and passage of docket 0419. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. The docket is passed. Council Murphy seeks suspension of the rules and passage of docket 0420. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. The docket has passed. We're on to personnel orders. Mr. Clerk, please read docket. 0421. Docket number 0421, Councilor Flynn for Councilor Braden. The Chair, the chair seeks suspension of the rules and passage of docket 0421. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. The docket is passed. 
Mr. Clerk, please read docket 0422. Docket number 0422, Councilor Flynn for Councilor Collette. The Chair seeks suspension of the rules and passage of docket 0422. All those in favor say aye. aye. All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. The docket is passed. We're on to late files. I am informed by the clerk that there are, there are three additional late file matters. The additional late file matter includes a personnel order, a hearing order from Councilor Bach. Mr. Clerk, what is the third one? That's a 17 F request from Councilor. Okay. And the third one is a 17 F request from Council Murphy. The late file matters should be on everyone's desk. I'm going to take a minute just to confirm they're on everyone's desk. Okay. We will take a vote now to add these late file matters into the agenda. All those in favor of adding the late file matters into the agenda, please say aye. Aye. Thank you. The late file matters have been added into the agenda. Mr. Clerk, can you please read the first late file matter into the record, which is the personnel order? Personnel order, Council of for Council of Murphy. The Chair seeks suspension of the rules and passage of this late file matter. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. This late file matter has been passed. Mr. Clerk, please read the second late file matter into the record, which is the hearing order from Council Bach. Offered by Council of Bach and Council of Louisiana. Order for a hearing to discuss trash contracts and procedures in Boston. Thank you. The Chair recognizes Councilor Bach. Councilor Bach, you have the floor. Thank you, President Flynn. Um, may I suspend Rule 12 and add Councilor Flaherty as an original co-sponsor? Hearing no objection, Councilor Flaherty is added. The Chair recognizes Councilor Bach. Great. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. This is a, sort of a refile, sort of a um, next step uh, or, um, order. So we thought we obviously have had a lot of conversations over the past year, both about pest control and then the related issues of how trash um, pickup works in the city of Boston. And then um, also in the fall, we talked about containerization and just the challenges in particularly some of the downtown neighborhoods where the standard thing is to put a, a bag on the, on the curb because there's nowhere for a container either in people's homes or really on the sidewalk. Um, and obviously we know that when those bags are out overnight, it's a huge driver of, of rodents and also just like unclean, um, unsanitary streets. Uh, so we had a lot of really productive conversation with the Department of Public Works last year. And one of the things that they were clear about was the fact that as the city comes up to its next generation of trash contracts, they want to kind of um, think about how to retool those in a way that allows us to get at some of these things and customize um, the procedures and also, you know, recognize that one size doesn't fit all in terms of um, some of the needs for different neighborhoods and the built form of the neighborhoods. Um, and so we're excited about the steps that they're taking on that. I think it's really important for the council that those trash contracts sort of are right. Like we, we've been talking about them a lot now for several years. So it's something that we want to keep our eyes on. We don't want to find out that we kind of missed an opportunity there. It's great that they've hired dedicated staff to focus on this, but I think the council wants to be abreast, obviously continuing like high labor standards for those trash contracts, which we see today is really important. Um, but just making sure that they can really kind of serve the various purposes we've talked about and hopefully give um, people in our neighborhoods like uh, much more targeted service at some of these issues. And so I'll say, for example, um, because in parts of my district, you have to just put it out in bags for most households. Like I would love to see us have a tighter time window for pickup on that so that people, and it's not reasonable for a tight time window to start at 6 a.m., right? Because, but like having a window that doesn't involve trash bags overnight, that it's like you gotta hit this, but then they get picked, picked up, I think would make the entire neighborhood way happier. I think there's stuff like that, that if we could customize it so that every neighborhood is getting service that matches its build form, it would make a big difference for the quality of life for our constituents. So um, we're excited to talk about this, and it's very much a kind of partnership with Public Works. This is the direction that they are already swimming in, um, but we want to follow it up in the Committee on City Services. So thank you, Mr. President, and thanks to my co-sponsors. Thank you, Council Block. The Chair recognizes Council Louis Jean. Council Louis Jean, you have the floor. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. President. Um, we have to customize trash contracts to better represent the variety and diversity of each of Boston's different neighborhoods. Breaking up these contracts can also give more opportunity for businesses that are owned by women and people of color to make sure that we are meeting our equity goals. 
so my office has had the incredible pleasure of working in partnership with uh, Public Works and their incredible team. Uh, shout out to Dennis Roach. Uh, we've visited many uh, dumpster sites across the city from Mattapan to Charlestown to address these concerns. It's resulted in multiple properties relocating dumpsters, <coughs> sorry, building corrals to maintain waste and scheduling multiple pickups to reduce overflowing. The work is tireless and requires immense handholding of problem property owners. Having to visit multiple times, follow up incessantly with emails and phone calls, simply to have dignified living conditions for our residents. <coughs> While this problem is pervasive throughout the city, it most severely impacts, I'm emotional, but it's not. <laughs> I'm not crying yet. <coughs> and while this problem is pervasive throughout the city, it most severely impacts those who live in our low income and black and brown neighborhoods. So I look forward to the work with Councilor Bach and Councilor Flaherty. Thank you. Th thank you, Councilor Lujan. <coughs> the chair recognizes Councilor Flaherty. Councilor Flaherty, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, thank you for the lead sponsor for including me and look forward to an expedited hearing. And also look forward to hearing from our Teamsters. Uh, if there's anyone that knows transportation, uh, logistics, uh, timely pickups and drop offs, uh, and uh, trained professionals that have commercial driver's license and uh, are able to operate uh, that heavy equipment. It's them. Um, they do this across the Commonwealth and beyond, and I bet that they've probably never been asked to have a seat at the table to help the city sort of draft, uh, again, programming and logistics around uh, trash pickup. Clearly, uh, they're instrumental in, in doing the work, uh, but I'd venture to say that they've probably never been asked to uh, offer suggestions and advice as to how to do it and how to do it better. So I, this is obviously in order for a hearing to discuss how our neighborhoods are different, pickup times and what have you. If there's anyone that has more experience than that, it's our Teamsters. So look forward to working with the, the uh, co-sponsors and my, and my colleagues. Thank you, Council Flaherty. The chair recognizes Councilor Murphy. Councilor Murphy, you have the floor. Oh, I'm sorry. Would anyone like to Sign on to this matter, please raise your hand. Mr. Kirk, please add Council Braden, Council Coletta, Council Fernandez Anderson, Council Flyer, Council Flyer, Council Mejia, Council Murphy, please add the chair. And I will speak briefly on this very important topic. These, as I said earlier, these neighborhood services, nuts and bolts of city government are critical. That's what people send us here to the Boston City Council for, is, is to deal with these neighborhood concerns. And there, there are many of them. But let's continue working together. We have the best city employees of any a city in the country. But we need to work better. We need to work smarter. And as we go into the budget season, we really need to advocate for funding for quality of life issues for neighborhood services. This late file matter will be referred to the Committee on City Services, Innovation, Technology. <clears throat> Mr. Clerk, the final late file matter. Councillor Murphy offered the file in order for uh, Section 17F regarding uh, bus drop off in the morning at English High School and bus drop off of students in the afternoon at English High School. Thank you. Thank you. The chair recognizes Council Murphy. Council Murphy, you have the floor. Thank you, um, and thank you to my colleagues for letting me um, have another late file. This information I've been trying to get, I did not get after Monday at 10, so I'm filing the late file now. I've been advocating for over four months now to address the special needs and wheelchair bus drop-off and pickup site at English High. I've had, um, just been having a little difficulty getting the information from BPS and this information is critical for me to properly advocate for the high school student who came here that day, Councilor, Council President Flynn, Councilor Flaherty, and Mayor Wu and Commissioner McCosh were here in the chamber back in October on Civic Engagement Day when our high school special needs students came with their teachers and th this ch chamber was full and there was a student who spoke up um, via his iPad and he was in a wheelchair and I made sure his microphone was adjusted and asked why at English High do the wheelchair special needs students have to get dropped off on the side of the building. Sorry, I get emotional about this. 
next to the trash barrel and the teachers have to lift up over a ledge and the sign on the door says, you know, food delivery and it's where the trash pickup is. So to me, it's a equity issue, it's a civil rights issue, it's an inclusion issue. And for me, the information needed here would just help me advocate stronger for this student. Like I told the administration, there's certain hills you're willing to die on. This is one of them. Even if the answer comes back that they're not gonna move it because of a convenience, at some point somewhere, a team, a school leader decided that the front entrance of the school wasn't convenient for the buses, so I'm doing a little history into that. But I do feel, and as a special need inclusion teacher for many years, and as we pour more funding, which I think is very necessary into BPS, to make sure all of our schools are more inclusive, every child has a right to enter through the front door, and they shouldn't just be scurried in the side door because it's closest to their classroom. So I think this information, on top of other information I'm advocating for, is going to help solve the issue. And thank you for letting me file this late. Thank you, Council Murphy. <coughs> Council Murphy is seeking suspension of the rules and passage of this late file matter. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. This, <coughs> nay. This late file matter has passed. We're on to green sheets. The chair recognizes Councilor Fernandez Anderson, and I believe Councilor Fernandez Anderson is going to pull docket 0111. The chair recognizes Councilor Fernandez Anderson. Thank you, Mr. President. That would be correct. I would like to pull docket 0111 um, on page two of the green sheets. Yeah, th th thank you, Councilor Fernandez Anderson. Mr. Clerk, can you please read that into the record? From the Committee on Ways and Means, docket number 0111. Message in order for your approval in order authorizing the City of Boston to appropriate an amount of $21,600,000 for the purpose of paying the cost of, a, of design and construction associated with boiler, windows, and door replacement projects at the following schools. Boston Day and Evening Academy, Henderson Upper School, Raphael Hernandez School, and the William E. Russell School. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. Um, as a reminder, this docket is for an appropriation in the amount of $21,600,000. Council Fernandez Anderson, can, can you hold on for one second, Mr. Clerk? Um, Mr. Clerk, can you poll the committee to ensure this docket is properly before the body? Committee on Ways and Means, Councilor Fernandez Anderson. Present. Councilor Worrell. Councilor Mejia. Yes. Councilor Lujan. Yes. Councilor Baker. And Councilor Braden. Is it properly before the body? Yes. This docket is properly before the body. The chair recognizes <coughs> Councilor Fernandez Anderson. Uh, thank you. As a reminder, again, this is uh, appropriation in the amount of $21,600,000 uh, to cover the cost of design and construction associated with the replacement of windows and doors with the Boston Day and Even Academy and, um, in Roxbury, partial boiler replacement in Henderson Upper School in Dorchester, replacement of school uh, windows and doors at the Rafael Hernandez School in Roxbury and a boiler re uh, replacement at the William E. Russell School in Dorchester. Uh, we took the first vote in the docket February 1st, 2023, and looking for the second vote today in the affirmative. Thank you. Thank you, Council. Thank you, Councilor Fernandez Anderson. <clears throat> Would anyone else like to speak on this matter? The chair recognizes Council Murphy. Council Murphy. Oh. I'm sorry. We're, we're in a brief um, one minute recess.
We have, we are back in we're back in session. Councilor Fernandez Anderson moves to take the second reading of docket 0111. Mr. Clerk, can you please take a roll call vote on docket 0111, please? Roll call vote on docket 0111. Councilor Arroyo. Councilor Baker. Councilor Bach. Yes. Councilor Bach, yes. Councilor Braden. Yes. Councilor Braden, yes. Councilor Coletta. Yes. Councilor Coletta, yes. Councilor Fernandez Anderson. Yes. Councilor Fernandez Anderson, yes. Council Flaherty. Yes. Council Flaherty, yes. Council Flynn. Yes. Council Flynn, yes. Council Lara. Council Lujan. Yes. Council Lujan, yes. Council Mejia. Yes. Council Mejia, yes. Council Murphy. Yes. Council Murphy, yes. Council Worrell. Docket number 0111 has received nine votes in the affirmative. Thank you. This docket has received its second reading. It has passed. Anyone else have anything in the green sheets? The chair recognizes Councilor Murphy. Council Murphy of the floor. I'd like to pull docket 0317 and 0318 from the green sheets. They're found on page 12 of 15. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mr. Clerk, for these dockets 0317 and 0318, can you please read them into the record? From the Committee on Public Health, Homelessness and Recovery, docket number 0317. Message in order for the confirmation of the reappointment of Rebecca Gutman as a member of the Boston Public Health Commission's Board of Health for a term expiring January 24th, 2024. And docket number 0318. Message in order for the confirmation of the appointment of Dr. Elsie Tavares as a member of the Boston Public Health Commission's Board of Health for a term expiring January 20th, 2026. Mr. Clerk, can we poll the committee to ensure that these are properly before the body? On the Committee of Public Health, Homeless, Homelessness and Recovery, Councilor Murphy. Yes. Councilor Baker. Councilor Louis Jean. Councilor Fernandez Anderson. Yes. And Councilor Arroyo. Properly before. Okay. Um, please note, Clerk, that I'm recommending that these pass in an amended version to reflect a clerical error in the original filing from the administration that did not correctly reflect the terms of these appointments. So I would like to thank P.J. McCann from the Public Health Commission who sent those corrections over after this meeting started and also thank Attorney Goldberg and City Council Messenger Rod and Cobb for getting all that paperwork um, around and handed out to everyone. So they are in an amended version to reflect the correct terms. So I, do we vote on the amendment first and then, um, we'll, and then do, we'll vote on passage? Yes, okay. as amended, yeah. Okay. C Councilor Murphy sure. moves for confirmation passage of docket 0317 as amended. All those in favor say aye. aye. All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. This docket has passed. Councilor Murphy seeks suspension of the rules for in amended form on pass on docket 0318. All those in favor say aye. aye. All opposed say nay. This docket has passed. Thank you. Both, so, conf yeah. both con appointments have been confirmed. Thank you. And just to clarify, as we all know, it's hard to get hearings on the calendar. And I did want to make sure that the work of the Boston Public Health Commission Board continues and getting these appointments in place sooner than later was helpful. So thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. We're on to the, well, anyone else want to take anything out of the green sheets? We're on to the consent agenda. I have been informed by the correct that there are no additions to the consent agenda. The chair moves for adoption of the consent agenda as presented. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Thank you. The consent agenda has been adopted.
memorials. Today we're going to adjourn our meeting in memory of the following individuals. And before I do mention the names, I would like to give my colleagues an opportunity to talk about a loved one, a constituent, or a friend, family member during this period of time. For Council for Council Block, Thomas McGuire, Dr. William Mackey, for Council of Flynn, and for Council Flaherty, John Joseph Nee. For Council of Louis Jean, Donald French, Jean, Fabrice, Ellison, Rollin Maynard Freeman. A moment of silence, please. Thank you. I do want to give my colleagues an opportunity to speak about a loved one. Let me go, let me start with Council Block. Council Block, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Mr. President. Um, I wanted to speak uh, today to Tom McGuire, who is on the list, longstanding clerk at the West End Civic Association. Um, Tom was born November 11th, 1956, and passed away on December 7th, 2022, at Massachusetts General Hospital in the company of uh, family and friends. He's being reunited with his parents, his stepmother, Virginia, and his partner of 24 years, James Pfeiffer. Um, there's a short line in Tom's obituary that honors him very succinctly. With his kind soul and quick laugh, he made friends easily. Uh, he really was like the life of the party wherever he was, and we um, we honored him at uh, at the last like uh, Weka um, community gathering. But um, he was really very beloved in the West End by and also by his nephews, nieces, siblings, his two cats, Happy and Benny. Um, and he was known for hosting get to know your neighbors parties in the West End, and just was really generous and compassionate and uh, caring neighbor, and also. Um, a dedicated volunteer arborist for the West End's trees. So I'm really going to miss Tom. And uh, I, um, I, wa I want to thank uh, Father Joe White um, from the West End for uh, some prayers lifted up with that community, but just wanted to recognize him in this space as well. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Council Block. The chair recognizes Council Flaherty. Council Flaherty, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. I'd just like to adjourn in memory of my father's uh, cousin, May Nee McDonald. Everyone always wonders uh, why I'm related to everybody. It's on my father's side. Yeah. They're like ants, right? But that was our connection to the knees. And uh, May was a wonderful woman, wonderful family. And uh, may she rest in peace. Thank you, Council Flaherty. The chair recognizes Council Mejia. Council Mejia, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. And I just want to um, acknowledge that uh, this is the third year anniversary of uh, Hilton Clark, who was uh, killed. He was my um, niece's boyfriend, and um, uh, she um, has been raising their only son together, um, and it has been really uh, traumatic for the family. So I just wanted to uplift his name. Um, when we think about the violence that's happening in our streets, these things are deeply uh, personal to many of us who are living these realities. So I just wanted to uplift his name um, and keep his family in our hearts and prayers and thoughts as they celebrate this passing anniversary. And then at the same time, I also want to just acknowledge that um, tomorrow will be my daughter's 13th birthday. And I think about that young man that was 13 that was also murdered in Mattapan, and just really holding our community um, together as we deal with all of this trauma that we all experience in our streets. And so I want to wish my daughter a happy birthday, um, who has sacrificed so much of me and time with me so I can serve this great city. Um, and she does so with um, so much um, grace for me. So I just wanted to uplift Annalise and wish you a very happy birthday. Thank you, Councilor Mejia. The chair recognizes Councilor Murphy. Well, my light's just... Okay. Give, give me... Uh, we're in recess for one, one, one second.
recognize the students that were recently killed in Michigan as well. So the chair moves today that when the council adjourns, we do so in memory of those mentioned. We are now scheduled to meet again in the INL chamber on Wednesday, March 1st at 12 noon. Before we depart, I want to say thank you to the clerk, the clerk's team, my city council colleagues and their staff, city council, central staff as well. All in favor of adjournment, please say aye. Aye. And, and the council stenographer. Thank you to the council stenographer. <laughs> the council is adjourned. <laughs>